Welcome to this masterclass. Thanks, first of all, to Jacques Maisco for inviting us here in this very splendid and marvelous center. And you know, it's a very big pleasure, a privilege, and probably an honor to work in this Aircat Center. Since 1994, the Aircat is the place to be when you want uh, to meet many and various uh, experts in the world and to share with us, with them, y your experience and to get them experience. Thanks to Jacques Marisco to support the pediatric surgeons since a very, very long time. <coughs> That's very important. And uh, thanks to you because you organized different courses all over the world in pediatric surgery and probably uh, they are very, very good, probably the best, I don't know, but uh, thanks to the Web Surge team. Web Surge is uh, absolutely marvelous. It changes um, a lot of time, but now we have a very, very good and useful Web Surge site with many short videos, excellent videos, some short courses, and that's really interesting. Thanks to Thomas Parent, Carlos Alves, and David Hiltenbrandt and all the secretaries of the Aircat Center. So, and of course, thanks to our friends and colleagues who are here today, uh, who are chairmen or speakers. Thank you very much. Philippe, a few words? Yes, a few words, a few words uh, after your very good presentation, Francois. Many, many thanks again to each of you uh, who devoted your work and your time to be present here. Historically, this kind of collaborative masterclass, that is to say, with a free and broadcasted discussion time all around the world, was agreed in 2016 by both EBs of the ESPES and the IPEG, respectively, ESPES European Pediatric Surgery uh, endoscopic surgeon and IPEG International Pediatric Endoscopy Group. This year, the ESPU, European Society of Pediatric Urology, was invited to join us in order to enlarge the audience and, moreover, with great respect to the huge influence of this scientific society. Topics of the three sessions were chosen after appropriate consultation of the three societies. Each society has one chairman here from the middle, Mario Mendoza at the middle on the left side is the former general secretary of the ESPES. At the right of him, Ala Professor Ali Gonaimi is the scientific secretary of the ESPU, European Society of Pediatric Urology. And at the left, Philippe Savai is the European representative of the IPEG, International Pediatric and Endoscopy Group. Our six speakers are either president or vice president or main members of the various boards, international and or national, uh, they will be presented by uh, their chairman afterwards. How it will work? Each speaker will give a talk, a presentation of 20 minutes. Then it will be a discussion time. Everywhere you are, connect you to the IRCAD website, web search, that is to say, write your question, give your name and your institution name. The chairman will read you onto its screen. All sessions will be continuously broadcasted and recorded via the web, with the web search and YouTube too. Many thanks to all of you and I give uh, the speak to uh, Mario Mendoza one of the chairman and the chairman of the first session. Thank you again.
Well, it's a pleasure to be here again in the IRCAD. This is a great place, and um, we're very happy to participate in this third master class that join the, some of the best and the main societies in uh, pediatric minimal invasive surgery. So um, I would like also to thank uh, Professor Marisco and the IRCAD facilities for this support. Uh, also, Francois Begmore and you, Philippe, for this great organization, and all the speakers and my colleagues, Chairman, for, to participate in this, in this event. So we will start with the first session that includes the discussion for appendicitis. And um, our first uh, speaker is Professor Mark Vulcan from the Emory School of Medicine in Atlanta, and also surgeon chief in the Children's Healthcare in Atlanta. And he will speak about laparoscopic versus open appendectomy in children. Thank you very much. And thank you, Francois and uh, Philippe, as well as Philip for inviting me. It's a privilege to be here, and I'm very excited about this. So I'm going to talk about laparoscopic versus open appendectomy. Uh, you know, so I, we'll start out and say I have no financial disclosures. So our objectives in this brief talk are going to be to describe the various approaches to appendicitis, or I should say some of them, because my colleague Chiro is going to uh, go into this in more detail. We're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of open versus laparoscopic. Uh, approaches to appendicitis, and then we recently completed a study on variations of care in appendicitis uh, in the United States on a large inpatient sample database. I'd like to just share with you some highlights of that. So with appendicitis, there's a lot of choices. You have open, you have laparoscopic, you have single site, and you may not even need to operate. So there's a lot of decisions that you need to make. So hopefully today we're going to clear this up for our audience just a little bit. So. I'm going to concentrate on laparoscopic versus open appendectomy <clears throat> and then say, is it really a contest? So as I perused the literature looking to see where I could find the best information on this, aside from just my expert opinion, uh, I found this meta-analysis from 2006. Uh, you know, it's a, a lot of people haven't really concentrated on the open versus laparoscopic since then. And for a lot of us in the laparoscopic world, we sort of think that we just assume that everybody's doing it this way, but as I'll show you when we looked at it even in the United States, that there are still plenty of open appendectomies done. But I thought it would be worthwhile to look and see what evidence there is out there as we make decisions on how we're going to approach appendicitis. So I'm sorry for the uh, busy slide, and it's, you're not supposed to be able to look at all this necessarily in detail, but just to highlight on the box and say <laughs> operating time. So operating time across all these studies, there's really no difference. Okay, so if we're going to look at this, and this is over, it's about 6,400 patients that they looked at in this total metal analysis, and it includes several prospective randomized trials that were done in the early 2000s. But basically no difference. Some it was more, some it was less, but no difference. Length of stay. So do the, how long do the patients stay in the hospital? Again, when you look at these studies, it actually favors laparoscopic, and that's something that we've always, uh, we've always thought is possible, uh, certainly for those of us that do it. I still run into people that say, well, I can, I don't know how many of you out there say, you know, I can do an appendectomy through an incision this big, and they go home the next day. In the laparoscopic world, we're actually sending them home the same day in a lot of cases in the modern era. Then when you look at complications, again, not to go into any details, but the uh, bottom line is in laparoscopy, you have less wound infections. There are some studies, and people do quote literature that says that you may have more intra-abdominal infections with laparoscopy, but that, again, that was not statistically significant when you look at lots and lots of patients. So this is one uh, that was not in this study, but this is another complication that we don't talk about. It's a late complication of open surgery. Uh, and that is bowel obstruction. So one of the things that my group was interested in is what causes bowel obstructions. And it turns out that appendectomy was the third leading cause of bowel obstruction admissions to our children's hospital. And the preponderance of those cases were either laparoscopic appendectomies, and there were a few, I mean, I'm sorry, open appendectomies. There were open appendectomies that were causing the bowel obstructions. Or there were some patients that had complicated appendicitis that came back. But in simple appendicitis, we didn't have 
any laparoscopic appendectomies that came back with a bowel obstruction. Now again, in order to really prove this, you need to do a long-term longitudinal study. But I think one of the biggest advantages of laparoscopy is that you decrease that lifelong risk of bowel obstruction. Uh, if you, we speak to our adult surgeon colleagues, they will tell you that they still see a lot of patients coming into their emergency departments and in acute surgery coming in with bowel obstructions, many times from surgeries that we did when patients were babies or children. So the bottom line when I looked at all of this was I think it favored laparoscopy. And again, I will admit my bias because that's what I do. Uh, but I think based on the wound infection rate, uh, the, uh, ili there, is, there is less ileus uh, with uh, laparoscopic surgery. And the length of stay, I think it makes it worthwhile to favor laparoscopy. Now, weren't able to demonstrate a difference in intra-abdominal abscess or operating time. And I put an asterisk there because if you actually uh, case match them, uh, if you look at just the random, prospect of randomized trials, again, it's not statistically significant. There is some concern that there might be a slightly higher incidence of intra-abdominal ab abscess with laparoscopy, but again, it never really pans out. And again, I think the small bowel obstruction is something that we underestimate. But what are the other factors to consider? What about the in intangible factors of training our residents and our fellows, or for us as as uh, fully trained surgeons who are learning laparoscopy or getting into laparoscopy. An appendectomy is a very good way to introduce yourself or your system and your hospital to laparoscopy. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, it can, it's, you don't have to do any suturing, but you start to get comfortable with the instruments. And it really is a platform upon which you can learn other things. Uh, Chiro is going to talk a little bit more about whether you do staplers, endo loops, how you, and I'll talk a little bit about port placement. Uh, but and this is still an intern case, you know, or a resident case. It's still a great case for trainees. So again, I think these intangible factors really, really help us get comfortable with laparoscopy. It helps your team, your operating room get comfortable with it. So again, that you are able to then use this as a platform upon which you can build to do other <coughs> cases as well. I am going to go a little bit into technique. Um, so one of the things that uh, we always do is, uh, so this is the abdomen, and this is, I'm assuming, a larger child because I'm using a 12 millimeter port in the umbilicus, a five in the left lower quadrant, and then a five suprapubic. Uh, if it's a small baby, it might be a five and two threes. Now one of the things that I do is I actually move the camera over to the left lower quadrant port so that you're actually triangulating in on the appendix right here so that you get, you can see what you're doing and then you have true triangulation. There are some that you'll see they'll put the port, the right-handed port up here and a left-handed port there. It's not as good, I do not think it gives you as good of exposure and it doesn't give you the right angles that you need. But here again, the other thing, a real basic principle is here's your surgeon, here's your patient, here's your pathology and here's your screen and they all line up so that you're standing in line so that you're not operating with your head cocked to the side or anything like that, because I've seen people put monitors in all kinds of strange places for appendicitis. You want it lined up so that you're looking straight at the monitor. Otherwise, when you get to be old like me, then your neck hurts, your back hurts. It's, uh, it's better for you and it's better for the patient. So just some quick uh, things that we do on our technique. First of all, we, use the, uh, we actually use electrocautery. We don't use anything fancy, even on teenage patients with the, uh, with the meso appendix. You can get the, the appendiceal artery. If it's particularly large, you can even just take a uh, mosquito and pinch it and pinch burn it, and it's not a problem. You do not have to spend the money on a stapler load or spend the time on an endo loop. Then I usually divide the stapler with, a, with or divide the appendix with a stapler. Uh, if you want to use an endo loop, that's probably, that's just fine too. Uh, the stapler is faster, so it saves you on operating room time. The endo loop is, uh, is a little less, it, well, it's a lot less expensive than the stapler, but it takes a little bit longer. And I think, again, Chiro is going to talk about that. If it is gangrenous or anything but just early appendicitis, I usually put it into an endo catch bag. Since you have a 12 millimeter port in your right hand, it's really easy to put your 10 millimeter endo catch bag there and it comes out very easily. Always inspect, and then you always want to go in and suction. 
uh, suction any pus or anything else that you see down there. I personally am not an irrigation person. We could probably do a whole nother, could probably spend half a day of a session talking about irrigation or not. Uh, I just, I suction, I don't irrigate, inspect, make sure you have hemostasis and everything looks clean. And that's my basic appendicitis. So I did say that I wanted to talk about, you know, what, you know, why are we talking about open versus laparoscopic appendectomy? Because I'm sure many of you out there are doing open appendectomies. Many of you out there are doing laparoscopic appendectomies. When we look just at, the, uh, at a very large inpatient uh, sample database in the United States, and this is tens of thousands of patients, uh, what we saw when we look at the use of laparoscopy is that there is a fair amount of variation. Each of these lines is a hospital. And these are confidence intervals on how often they use uh, laparoscopy. But what you'll see here also, the yellow is a non-children, yellow and gray are non-children's hospitals, and the, uh, the pink and the blue are children's hospitals. So you can see even among some children's hospitals, there's still some that don't do total laparoscopy. But children's hospitals do most laparoscopy, and that's statistically significant. Uh, and in the United States, that may be some of the difference between a pediatric surgeon or an adult general surgeon doing pediatric appendectomies. In an adult general hospital, they may be less comfortable with it, so they're doing more open appendectomies. Uh, in the big cities and the children's hospitals, you can see many here, it's actually they do 100% of their cases laparoscopically. Uh, we also, and again, this is, this is looking at complicated appendicitis. In the children's hospitals, we tend to use more IV nutrition or parenteral nutrition, be that peripherally or centrally for uh, patients with complicated appendicitis. Whether that's associated with better outcomes or not, this does not prove that. This is just showing that if you're in a pediatric hospital with pediatric surgeons, you will tend to get more parenteral nutrition. Uh, and then when you look at composite complication rates, uh, this is, so if you are in a non-children's hospital, then your complication rate is higher. Now, do we associate that with laparoscopy? Do we associate that with specialized pediatric care? There are a lot of factors, and this is just an association, and that's all we can say with this large, because it's an inpatient sample database based on basically billing data from uh, Medicaid in the U.S., but it includes all patients. But you see the yellow hospitals or the children's hospitals are actually high outliers for, with lower complications. Length of stay is also overall lower in your children's hospitals, so we may be doing something different. And again, we need to be doing more outreach and make sure that we are educating other surgeons and the adult surgeons that are taking care of some of these patients in adult uh, general hospitals that may have a pediatric ward how to do this. So again, when we look at the variations in care, just to summarize, there's more parenteral nutrition, lower complication rates, there's more laparoscopy. Uh, it's, the length of stay is greater, but if you risk adjust, it's not that far off. Um, the other piece that I didn't show here, and, and I don't know if it's relevant to the rest of the world, is that uh, children's, ho I said non-children's hospitals are less expensive, but children's hospitals, whatever we do, we may get better results, but you have to be willing to pay for it because children's hospitals are more expensive. So my overall conclusions are that lapar laparoscopic appendectomy, I think, is likely superior based on the data, but I do think that even when you look at the data, it is superior, and I think the intangible factors is a training platform for a step off to do more complex procedures and getting your team comfortable and getting you comfortable with the instrumentation is the right way to go. Uh, again, I'm going to say the right way to do the laparoscopic appendectomy is not proven, uh, and uh, again, Chiro is going to go a little bit more into techniques, and there's still lots of variations of care, at least in the United States, and I assume the rest of the world. So we can either do questions now, or I don't know if it'll make sense for questions now, or for both of us to go, and then, okay. Thank you very much, Mark. So now um, we are, have our second speaker, and then we're going to have uh, 20 minutes for questions at the end. So our next speaker is Professor Chiro Esposito from the Department of Pediatric Surgery, University Federico II in Naples, Italy. And he will speak about the single port versus multi-port and the role of the new technologies in the management of the pediatric complicated appendicitis. Chiro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues and friends. Um, my talk will be focused on uh, the management of complicated appendicitis 
and particularly will be focused on some aspect of technique, single port versus multi-port, and the role of new technologies. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. As you know, the majority of pediatric patients uh, operated for acute appendicitis uh, have uh, a complicated appendicitis with uh, a perforation rate in general higher than 90% and depends on the age. As Mark previously said, probably for uncomplicated appendicitis, laparoscopy can be considered the gold standard of a treatment. The problem is the management of a complicated appendicitis because uh, you have uh, some problems, management of abscess, peritonitis, and perforation. As you can see in uh, these videos, uh, the anano anatomic situation during a complicated appendectomy is difficult to understand because it's difficult to find anatomic landmark. You have to find the appendix. There are a lot of material inside the abdominal cavity and a lot of adhesions. The appendix uh, uh, usually is located or retrocecally or in the Douglas space uh, and is difficult sometimes to find. Uh, uh, analyzing our recent literature is the severity of the appendicitis. For this reason, I will focus my attention on some technical variation, in particular the use of single port versus multi port, the uh, procedure to close uh, the stamp using and the looper and the stapler, and uh, the method used to perform peritoneal lavage using irrigation or suction or both. The first part is focus on the, the use on single or multi port. As you know, at the beginning and the end of the 80s was described the first laparoscopic appendectomy in adults used three trocar. Then there were a lot of procedures described, only one trocar or the single incision laparoscopic appendectomy, but there are several options, self-made, using a finger glove or uh, some rings with several holes. Uh, what is the evidence on, on this point? As you know, the history showed that the first uh, appendectomy was performed in adults using three trocar. That, at the end of the night, was described another technique, described first of all by adult surgeon Jean Frederic Bejan, and then uh, described by our group and the group of Jeff Valornis using only one trocar. The technique is extremely easy to perform because you have to perform an open laparoscopy, you have to introduce in the abdomen a blantic trocar and then you have to use uh, an operative optic. This optic has uh, an operative channel uh, that can grasp the appendix, uh, as you can see, and then exteriorize the appendix uh, through the navel. And then you can complete the procedure outside the abdominal cavity uh, and is extremely easy to perform with only one incision. And this is the picture that summarizes the technique. The first phase on left side is uh, the introduction of the optic. Uh, you can grasp the tip of the appendix. You can, the, on the second part, you can exteriorize it. Another procedure that was described at the beginning of 2000 was the single incision laparoscopic appendectomy. With this technique, you use uh, a big trocar of about 20 millimeter in diameter, and we can introduce in this trocar uh, an optic plus two instruments. This, this uh, trocar has several holes. But the problem is that the instruments are coaxial. For this reason, it's difficult to move it. For this reason, you need the special curved instruments. And uh, 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 this technique has a big uh, diffusion at the beginning of 2000, and then have a limited diffusion after, because it's too challenging for the surgeon and uh, for the high costs. For this reason, you know, there are several papers that compare the two techniques, only one trocar with the single incision laparoscopic appendectomy. And it seems that one trocar appendectomy is technically easier and above all, it reduces costs. Uh, but the problem is that uh, one trocar appendectomy is preferable for simple appendicitis. In case of complicated appendicitis with perforation, you need to position additional trocar to complete the procedure. We perform a multicentric survey published on surgical endoscopy, and the, uh, in case of complicated appendicitis, you can start with only one trocar to see the anatomy, but you have to add one or two trocar to switch 
to multiport hybrid laparoscopic appendectomy to complete the procedure safer. As you can see, these are the results of this study. In complicated appendicitis, multiport hybrid laparoscopic appendectomy reduce operative time and analgesic requirement, and above all, the incidence of complication compared to only one stroker. For this reason, the uh, conclusion on this point is that one stroker appendectomy is a valid and safe technique for simple appendicitis, but in case of complicated appendicitis, you have to add one or two stroker to complete the procedure and to switch to multiport laparoscopic appendectomy. The second point, the second part of my talk with Bifocal, on new technology to treat appendix and meso. As you know, there are two main possibilities to treat uh, the appendix, use an endosapler, as Mark showed in, in his videos, and the use of endoloop. The endoloop is uh, enough easy uh, to position. You can introduce it uh, through a 5 millimeter stroker. You have to position the endoloop at the base of the appendix. If you want, you can position a second one and then cut in the middle and then to remove the appendix. The other uh, technique is to use the endostapler. Uh, the majority of endostapler are of 20 millimeters in diameter, but now there are also smaller ones. You have two possibilities. Use an endostapler through a 12 millimeter ports, or the other alternative is to exteriorize the appendix through the umbilicus and to cut the appendix outside, outside the abdominal cavity. The drawback of endostapler is that endostaplers are expensive. You need a 12 millimeter port, and sometimes, considering the, that the appendix is too small, they leave metal staples inside. For this reason, pay attention to this point. The main drawbacks of endoloop is, above all, if you have a perforation of the appendix, above all, at the base of the appendix, it's not safe to position in the loop when the base of the appendix is perforated. For this reason, what is better to use an uh, endoloop or endostapler? We perform another multicentric international survey on this point, uh, and we analyze the data of about 700 patients. Uh, half of them operated for complicated appendicitis using endoloop, and the other half used an endostapler. And the result was that complication as intradominal abscess, postoperative ileus readmission, reoperation was statistically lower in endostapler group. For this reason, the conclusion of, of this study was that endostapler is safer to treat complicated appendicitis. Another interesting point is that sometimes, in case of complicated appendicitis, it is difficult to find a plan on dissection. Probably it's uh, useful to use, in this case, the new hemostatic device. There are new hemostatic devices available on the market that have FDA approval, and using this device is easy to perform the dissection, and above all, you reduce using this devi uh, device um, we reducing the bleeding. You can put the device on the bench, and in case of problem with monopolar coagulation, you can use it to complete safely the procedure. The third part of this talk was focused on the use of irrigation suction or suction alone to perform a toilet of uh, the abdominal cavity during the procedure. As you know, uh, it's important to perform the toilet of peritoneal cavity in case of complicated appendicitis because you have a lot of materials inside and you have the risk to have abscesses at the end of procedure. For this reason, you, you have uh, to decide if you want to use uh, only suction or irrigation and suction. The problem is still debated because, uh, as you know, there is a duration for use the irrigation is that uh, you diluted the bacterial road, but there are also some arguments to use irrigation is that you can diffuse uh, uh, bacterial in all the abdominal cavity. Probably analyzing the international literature uh, is important. The, re the result are that it is important to use uh, an abundant lavage of peritoneal cavity, but you have to use a low pressure of irrigation. In this way, you avoid diffusing uh, the bacterial all in all the abdominal cavity. 
At the end of this talk, analyzing the international literature, I would like to give you some technical recommendation as for the management of complicated appendicitis. First of all, in case of a complicated appendicitis, you can start with one stroker to see the anatomy, but in case of perforation, please add other stroker to complete the procedure safely. As for the sealing device, in case of problem with monopolar or bipolar coagulation, please use the new sealing device because in this way you have a safer dissection and you reduce the risk of bleeding. As for you, which is the best way to, to treat the stamp? In case of complicated appendicitis, the best thing to do is to use an automatic stapler because in this way this technique is safer compared to the use of end loop. And uh, to reduce wound infection uh, and you have a perforation, please use an bag or a cheaper Steriglove finger and to put uh, the appendix inside to avoid the contact with the skin and to reduce, to reduce wound infection. And at the end, uh, to clean the abdominal cavity, the best way to do it is to use an abundant lavage, but with a low pressure of irrigation to reduce the diffusion. And these are my conclusion. In case of complicated appendicitis, hybrid appendectomy seems safer com compared to one stroker appendectomy. Uh, automatic stapler in case of a complicated appendectomy seems safer compared to ligatory using and the loop. As for the dissection, the neonostatic device can be useful for dissection and above all it reduces the risk of bleeding. As for irrigation suction, you have to use both, but please remember to use low pressure irrigation to avoid diffusion of bacteria in the abdominal cavity and to reduce uh, uh, wood infection, please use extraction bag to extract the appendix. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Chiro. So now the session is open for questions, and I invite all participants to send your questions to the chat, please. You will have all the priority for your questions, so please, I invite you to send as much questions as possible. So we have the first question from um, uh, Slovakia from Dr. Martin Smrek that wants to know if there is a difference in the use of prophylactic antibiotics between these techniques, between open and laparoscopic. No, so your prophylactic antibiotics should be the same either way. And there, the evidence for antibiotics with simple appendicitis is really just for your preoperative dose. I know a lot of people want to continue it for 24 or 48 hours, but uh, really just one dose preoperatively is going to be plenty. In complicated appendicitis, it's a little bit different. In complicated appendicitis, your antibiotic management is going to be based, on, again, on the, on the appendicitis and what you see. But uh, we, we do a course of seven to 10 days of antibiotics with a combination of intravenous and then transitioning to oral antibiotics. But again, it's not dependent upon your approach. It's uh, only dependent upon the appendicitis itself, whether it's simple appendicitis or complicated appendicitis. Okay, thank you very much for your question. We have a question also from uh, our chairman. Mark, thanks for the great talk. When you tell us that this is still an internal resident procedure, what do you think when you ran into people who are still doing it open? And what is hindering the laparoscopic procedure to be spread out or distributed all over, also outside of very high sophisticated countries, to be done laparoscopically? So, well, I, I can tell you in the United States, I think there is a fear of doing laparoscopy on smaller children if you're an adult general surgeon doing the appendectomy. Now, more and more, even in the outside hospital or in the non children's hospitals, they're being done by pediatric surgeons in the U.S. I think some of it is just inertia. In other countries, I think it's part of it is really getting that comfort, and it may be cost, and getting the equipment. Uh, you know, certainly if we look at some of, some countries, as you know, uh, it's very difficult to get the equipment, and they may not have everything there. But there are there are ways that you can work with that. And again, you know, there's a lot of when we do it, we use a fair amount of disposable trocars and instruments. 
Um, you can do this all with reusable instruments as well to reduce the cost. But I would think it's cost and experience. And, and it's possible that you have older surgeons that haven't been exposed to it that would benefit from mentorship. Thank you very much. So we have another question from um, France, from Dijon. Dr. Fawaz Abo Alessan wants to know about the drains. So what is exactly the uh, place for draining, especially in the localized peritonitis? As for position of drains uh, after um, uh, perforated appendicitis, usually we use uh, the all of the two trocars of five millimeter. For this reason, we prefer to put uh, two drains uh, in the abdominal cavity using the two five millimeter trocars. I was just going to make a, a comment, though, that I, I think that's still also controversial because we rarely use drains. We only use drains preoperatively if they have an abscess and we're going to treat it with antibiotics. But even if it's localized peritonitis, we suction it clean and go from there. In case of drains, which type of drains do you recommend? We, we use uh, circular drain in aspiration uh, that we put inside and uh, we leave uh, for a couple of days. Also, uh, like Ma Mark uh, previously said, we perform a good toilet uh, during the procedure, but prefer uh, for security reasons to leave a drain or a couple of drains uh, for about 48 hours to, to be sure that you have no problem. Thank you very much. Sir. So we have another question from India from Dr. Lavanya Kanalian, how to prevent stump appendicitis? I think the, the best way to prevent stump appendicitis is to take the stump flush with the cecum. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I, I do think that people are a little more aggressive with the, uh, with the stapler when you do that. And I think yeah. it's, it's I've, I've never seen stump appendicitis in a stapled. Uh, appendectomy. Uh, I have seen it in one that's tied off that was done open. Do you have some comments? Yes, uh, we, we do the same. Uh, our experience is always in case uh, of um, perforated appendicitis using a stapler and with stapler you have no problem or stop appendicitis. is a problem that you can have using endo loop. Thank you very much. So we have another question from the group of chairman. So to both of you, Cheng, thanks, uh, Chiro. Um, when you tell us that hybrid appendectomy using endo loops or better endo bags, um, stapling devices, energy devices, what would you tell people from all over the world, like those guys who are chatting in from India, Pakistan, and all other countries, where those disposable materials might not be um, available in that amount and might be costly, so what do, do you tell people over there how to perform laparoscopic appendectomy? So I, I think you can use monopolar cautery, you can use the hook, but you can also take a Maryland type dissector and hook it up to cautery using monopolar and apply gentle pressure on the appendiceal artery and it seals almost as well as any of these expensive energy devices. Uh, for, the end, for the endo bag, you can simply cut off the thumb from a, from a glove and put the appendix in that, uh, and that can also decrease costs. And again, you can use reusable trocars and reusable instruments, and I think that then it becomes less of a factor. I don't know if you want to. Yes, uh, I agree with Mark's comments. I think that uh, if you have all the material, we have to put all the material on the bench uh, and the stapler and the loops uh, the sealing device. And then if you need it, you can use in case of problem. If you haven't this kind of material, you can use monopolar and uh, a finger glove to, uh, to extract the appendix. Uh, and uh, in case of problem, probably the best thing to do is exteriorize the appendix through the umbilicus and to, per to perform the, the procedure outside using uh, normal ligature. I think that the finger glove, Philippe Pontupé described this technique probably 25 years ago, I remember. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now talking about these instruments, there is a question from Taiwan asking if you have some tips on how to maneuver the endostaplers in these small cavities. 
So when you're introducing the endostapler, there, if, a lot of them reticulate on the end, so you want to take advantage of that. The other thing is that in some of the children that are smaller, if you have the back part of the stapler still in the trocar, it won't open up. So the trick for that is to move the stapler into the hollow of the pelvis, open it up, and then pull back. The other thing you want to make sure is take your insufflation off of that port, put it on another port, because if you need to, you can even pull back the pull the port out and back the stapler out further. But you know, again, I, I don't think that there is, and we do we we also will pull them up through the umbilicus. That's another way. If it's really hard, you can do that. And now there are five millimeter staplers on the market as well uh, that you can get that are much smaller and much easier to use. Uh, they're just uh, they're just more expensive. I think that the two main drawbacks of endostapler are the costs, and then that the majority of endostaplers are in 12 millimeter in diameter. Probably with uh, the last generation of endoslapper, it is easy to perform an appendectomy because you can, can turn the tip of endostapler in this way, it is easy to manage. With the old type, with the right one, it probably is more difficult. But the alternative, if you have difficulty inside, you can exteriorize and to use endostapler outside. Thank you very much. We have another question from uh, Pakistan, from Dr. Mudassar asking if um, there is any difference in your experience regarding the uh, hospital stay in complicated appendicitis when they are treated laparoscopically or open. And the other question in the same is, what is the strategy when you find a normal appendix, if you get in there? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the length of stay in complicated appendicitis uh, is generally not different between, uh, between open and laparoscopic, and presumably, that's, that's simply because they're there, they stay in the hospital because of the appendicitis, not because of any pain issues around their incision. Uh, and I'll, I'll, you wanna just take the other questions and split it up? <laughs> Go ahead. And uh, to integrate uh, the, 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 the first questions, uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, um, is uh, is important. Uh, uh, which is the question? <laughs> <laughs> so it was the second the second no, part the of the question. One. No, the first the first one was uh, difference. Ah, yeah, the stay stay. I think yeah. in my memory I have no memory of open appendectomy, but okay. it depends uh, of the stages of the appendix. But yeah. sometimes if you have a palm peritonitis. The, op the hospital stays is long and you have an ileus of about 10 days for this reason. I think uh, the, uh, the approach of laparoscopy don't change the hospital stay. It depends on the peritonitis. Uh, if you find a normal appendix, uh, uh, as you know, the appendix can be useful because you can use the appendix to reconstruct the biliary trees uh, or the ureter. Probably you have to live inside because uh, it is free and you have to find other condition, above all if there is a mechal diverticulum or a gynecology problem. And I would, I would add that this is another reason that laparoscopy is superior, is because when you have a normal appendix that you can find the Meckel's diverticulum or the torsed ovary, or maybe it's just an ovarian cyst. I would say in, in, the, in the U.S., the practice is to remove the appendix even if it looks like it's normal appendicide, even if it looks normal, because occasionally it's not really. Thank you very much. We have another question, again, from Dijon, from uh, Dr. Abu Al-Hassan, and um, want to know uh, the attitude of uh, a situation where you enter the abdominal cavity, you find the abdomen with a severe peritonitis, and it's difficult to find the appendix or to do the appendectomy. And then uh, you clean, you drain, and you leave. And if it's possible to perform a, a later appendectomy, what is your, your, your opinion about this type of scenario? So those scenarios are usually very late presenting appendicitis. And you know, a lot of times we actually try to treat those, we try to identify those patients up front and treat them with antibiotics first. I think that you have the opportunity, if you get in there and it looks just a complete mess, you can't find a peritoneal cavity, 
Uh, depending on whether you have access to imaging or not, um, if you didn't get cross-sectional imaging, it's, there's no shame in stopping the operation, getting cross-sectional imaging, or otherwise, if it's just a total mess and even if you had imaging, you can, in that case, I would just leave drains, get out and treat with antibiotics because I think you can sometimes cause more harm uh, than good. Yes, so we do the same thing. We perform a laparoscopy. We put the first trocar with the optic. Then, if it's difficult to find, we put two other trocars. We try to identify the appendix if there is a mass and there is the risk to create a iatrogenic lesion on the colon. We put drain, and when we put the, the child on antibiotics. And when deferring the appendectomy, what would be the surprises that you would expect? So we go back at six to eight weeks and come back. But we've had some patients that have had recurrent appendicitis in the meantime. Let's see if they go earlier. At, at least one month, but uh, we speak with the parents because uh, in case of problem or abdominal pain, we have deoperated before this, this kind of children. Thank you very much. We have also another question from uh, Pakistan, uh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif, asking if uh, in your opinion, there is more risk of bleeding when using staplers than other devices. So in our experience using the stapler on the appendiceal stump, we have not had problems with bleeding. Now we use the uh, small load. So we use the narrow staplers, uh, whether it's a vascular load or whatever it's called, uh, you know, and the different brands have different names for it in different colors. But we tend to use the uh, vascular or the thin load. In general, before using an ossepler, we, uh, before we, we treating the meso and we coagulate the meso to reduce the risk of bleeding, so when we put the endosepler, in general, there is uh, no risk of bleeding. The problem with the endosepler of 12 millimeters is sometimes there are some staples that remain inside. For this reason, you have to look at and to remove uh, at the end of the procedure. What would you both consider is, is there a role for non-operative treatment of appendicitis in, chil in children? So if you look at the, the studies that Sean St. Peter in Kansas City did, you know, there was, at first it was like we ought to be treating almost everybody non-operatively and then operate on them that it's overall better. And then when you do it prospectively, well, maybe there's not so much difference anymore. And, you know, I think that it's really hard. I don't think we know how to identify exactly which patients benefit from non-operative treatment up front. So for complicated appendicitis, uh, you know, our practice is to avoid that case where you go in and it's just a total mess and you can't find anything. So if, they're, if they've had symptoms for five days or a week or more, we just treat them with antibiotics. We do cross-sectional imaging, uh, and if they have an abscess, then we will go ahead and percutaneously drain that uh, and then treat them with antibiotics, come back in you know, sometime between one and two months and take their appendicitis. In simple appendicitis, uh, that's, you know, that's a whole other situation. Uh, the, in all the studies with simple appendicitis treated with antibiotics, there's still a pretty high recurrence rate, you know, whether it's 20%. And the question, you know, and, and at least in the U.S., when you start talking to parents about that, and we've offered it, uh, there's very few takers. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's our bias, but, you know, they're worried that their kid's going to be off, you know, hiking in the Alps here and, uh, you know, get appendicitis and have a problem. So they just take it out. Yes, uh, I, I think that's the same. The problem is that if you are... Um, in, um, in a country far away from a center of pediatric surgery, the only way is to treat with the antibiotics. In case of acute appendicitis, I think if you have a, a surgical center, you have to operate. If, for example, you have a, a, an appendicial mass already in treatment with antibiotics, we can complete the treatment, then follow with instrumental control, and then we can decide to perform an interval appendectomy after one month or six weeks. Another controversial question could be, when you have patients with a chronic abdominal pain, where you have done everything, and then you finally decide to go to the last point, which is an exploratory uh, laparoscopy, are you doing also a 
appendectomy, even if you find everything normal? Or what could be your attitude? So I do not. I, I leave, in that case, I, I leave the appendix unless, <laughs> unless there is clearly focal right lower quadrant pain and it sounds like, quote unquote, appendiceal colic, which I don't know if it exists or not. There are some people that swear by it. Now, you do that, you take the appendix out, some of these patients, or a lot of these patients, will get better for a time. And then a lot of times, they're, uh, within a year, their abdominal pain comes back. So if everything looks normal and it's not classic postprandial right lower quadrant pain or whatever you know, they say that appendiceal colic is supposed to do, I leave the appendix in. I don't take it out. If uh, a child uh, has a chronic abdominal pain and went to emergency several times, I think there is an indication to perform a laparoscopic exploration. In this way, you can check the appendix, uh, the mecal, the, uh, if there are gynecology problems in girls, or sometimes there are adhesion. If the appendix uh, is uh, not uh, inflamed, we can leave it, but sometimes only laparoscopic exploration with a little bit of peritoneum can solve the problem. Thank you very much. We have one more question. One final question for both of you. In an ideal world where everybody performs laparoscopic appendectomy, is this a disadvantage that nobody knows anymore how to do an open? I don't think so, because I think the principles of the operation are the same. And if you are a surgeon, you may not, you, you know how to make an incision, you know how to close an incision. And what you do on the inside is basically the same, depending on the instruments that you're using. And I, you know, I don't want to be that patient that has to have the operation. I don't want to have an open gallbladder so that somebody can learn how to do an open gallbladder. Does anyone, el anyone else here want to do that? <laughs> sure. I, I agree w with Mark. I think in a real world, you have to use laparoscopy to treat uh, appendicitis. Uh, I think as for cholecystectomy, I think uh, there is no role for open surgery, but you have to explore a, a chair for a, from chronic or acute abdominal pain. You have to perform a laparoscopy always. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the participation to this session, and then we're going to go to the second session, and I pass the, word to this, the microphone to my colleague, Philippe Savai. Well, thank you very much, and we move on to the next session. And on behalf of IPEC, it's my privilege and pleasure to um, moderate the next topic, which is going from abdominal to thoracic. It's dealing with uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And we have two speakers here, both very renowned pediatric surgeons worldwide. We have uh, Professor Francois Beckmer, who is kind of a host here. He's right here across, from across the street from the University Hospital of Strasbourg, and he's also director of the um, Urquhart courses here. He's a past president of the French Society of Pediatric Surgery, and he's both member of ESPES and IPEC, and he will talk about open approach for CDH. And then as a con session or con talk, uh, my friend and colleague, Holger Till, he's uh, head and chair of the Department of Pediatric Surgery in Graz, Austria. He's uh, one of the upcoming IPEC presidents, and he's on behalf of IPEC here to represent the um, thoracoscopic or minimal invasive approach to a CDH. And I'm very excited to listen to your talks, and um, then we will discuss this. So um, the first talk is uh, Francois, and um, please go. Thank you very much. Uh, we will fight, but gently, and at the end, we will be alive. <laughs> Both. <Very gently>. Uh, <laughs> gently. So the discussion is, um, there, is there a place for mini-invasive surgery in case of CDH when we want to repair a CDH in the neonatal period? That's the most important question. And uh, in fact, effectively, uh, we have to see, to have a look on the historical point of view because uh, we began our NICE experience, all of us, with delayed hernias, then incarcerated hernias, delayed hernias. And the question at this moment was, could we transpose exactly what we had done? Could we transpose this experience for newborns? And that is the main question. So at this time, you had David van der Zee and Klasbachs who began with uh, laparoscopy, 
silent with VATS, mini trachotomy plus three trochars, and we proposed trachoscopy. But it was only for these delayed hernias. And what, what, what is really delayed hernias? That's uh, um, uh, studies who will be present and, uh, presented in a, uh, short, in a short period, in two or three months, I hope. Well, it represents quite 10% of CDH. That's not a lot, but that's enough to begin with trachoscopy or laparoscopy. The mean age was nine months in this series. They are quite all left-sided hernia. You have associated malformations in these cases, 37% of cases, but there is no pulmonary hyperplasia and uh, no pulmonary hypoplasia, sorry, and no pulmonary hypertension. These are the main differences between these so-called delayed hernias and the hernias we have to treat for neonates. Well, these are not only um, uh, easy cases because we had emergency cases, incarcerated hernias, and they represent 65% of cases. And sometimes the need for patch closure is real because of cases. Uh, it represents 7% no of cases. I belong, uh, we no belong in France uh, to the French CDH no reference center. That's quite the study group, These CDH study group in the States and so on. And that's important because we worked uh, a lot together. Well, in fact, survival of CDH has improved due to the surgical approach, no. <laughs> the establishment of antenatal diagnosis, yes. Prenatal treatment, plug and unplug. ECMO, HA4 ventilation. Use of vasodilators for pulmonary hypertension. And plus, that's very important, I think, no displacement of the patient and surgery in the ICU. So, trachoscopic CDH repair is questionable. And when we see this sentence, misapproach to CDH has gained in popularity, that's a surprise because in this series, we find only 3.4% of patients treated by MIS. And recently, in we in Japan, uh, was speaking about trachoscopic repair, and he said it is the preferred treatment for CDH. However, several complications, including visceral injury, hypercapnia, capnia, and a high incidence of recurrence has be, have been reported. So, what are the results in uh, our French center? How many thoracoscopic for, for CDH repair? Only 10% of cases have been treated by, by, by this way, and less than 1% by laparoscopy. That's, that's not a lot. What is the profile, the main profile of these patients, trachoscopically repaired for CDH? No prenatal diagnosis, so-called delayed hernia, good prognosis, left-sided hernia, no need for a patch. So if we have to compare trochoscopy and laparotomy, we can read all the studies, and there is a very big problem because when we compare open versus misrepair, there are many, many selection criteria bias. There is a higher proportion of patch closure in the open repair group. It means severe cases when you need a patch. It may reflect the selection criteria used to the different, for the different teams. Surgical skill or experience in, in MIS is uh, one uh, criteria to, for the decision. Surgeon decides so the approach to open or MIS according to his own approach. experience. We can see that in the papers. And there are less prenatal diagnoses for the MIS repair group, so they can be called probably more delayed hernias than uh, emergency cases in neonates as we know. For instance, in the French uh, series, we performed most of the time a laparotomy, and uh, most of them had a prenatal diagnosis. Only 19% had no prenatal diagnosis. But for trachoscopy, that's not a surprise, no. 53% of cases did not have any prenatal diagnosis. 
When we compare these series, there are many selection bias. All the trials have selection bias. That is why we can read, for instance, post-operative mortality is higher after open surgery. That's not possible, you know. So that seems obvious when you know that severe cases are not proposed for miss. For instance, I saw, I saw this sentence, they did not undergo an attempt at miss CDH repair because the patients were too ill. Uh, occur. So uh, this is an excellent paper and a point of review. Numerous limitations, especially in the newborn period, have been reported. Many studies used guiding selection criteria for MIS. These selection criteria are associated with an important risk of selection bias, and these criteria differ from one study to another. So, is it easy and feasible to compare thoracoscopy and laparotomy? Certainly not. Numerous issues appeared in thoracoscopic repair, CDH. The displacement from ICU to the OR is often necessary for MIS, but it may, be very, it may be very deleterious. The mean operative time is longer with MIS. ETCO2 increases and pH falls down. We may have difficulty to reduce the hernia contents, difficulty to place and to attach the patch. A high level of recurrence rate is observed with or without a patch. What about rib anchoring stitches? May be an issue. Parietal wall development may be not good. Intercostal vessels and nerves are stitched, so that may be a problem. And the main problem, probably, the learning curve with a few cases per year is not so good. So operative time is longer for miss, quite 55 minutes more than for an, for an approach, an opponent approach. The longer operative time is highly unfavorable for neonates undergoing miss, owing the risk of acidosis, hypothermia, and so on. But the question is, when we read this paper, what is effectively the operative time? We need a clear definition Time from skin incision to skin closure. That has to be the operative time. Operative time is longer, too long for me. Certainly, when we see this, some papers with uh, three hours operative time for me, that's too long. And for the shorter in open surgery, one hour and a half, that's not long. Uh, but what is interesting is to compare uh, with or without a patch, with or without a conversion. And when we compare that, the differences are not so important because without a patch, miss is not so longer than open surgery. But with a patch or due to a conversion, it may be too long, too, very long. We have, in fact, new issues with the thoracoscopy. The lateral decubitus. When we, you try to install the patient on a lateral decubitus, if it doesn't go well, you stop. And you don't try to go to the OR and to try the uh, miss surgery. Insufflation, CO2 will speak. Increase of ventilatory pressure during the transfer between the IC, from the ICU to the operative room. And sometimes we had pneumothorax due to a barotraumatism just uh, due to the change of ventilatory during the transfer between the ICU to the uh, operative room. We have many, many uh, papers about the high acidosis and hypercapnia, and one uh, recent paper from Agostino Piero, 2015, um, compared open and thoracoscopy. Patients were randomized, but there were easy cases, only easy cases. Neonates were not requiring HFO, inhaled nitric oxide, no ECMO, the weight was right, they required less than 40% of the oxygen. And in this paper, the pressure, the intraoperative pressure was very high. And that's probably why you had uh, PaCO2 which increases and pH which that falls down. So he said at this moment, CDH should no longer be performed with this type of conventional insufflation and ventilation. And he proposed to change gas, uh, to choose gases as helium, argon, nitrogen, or even air for insufflation, but none of these dissolve as rapidly as CO2. 
resulting in a potential risk of embolism. So the, the best idea was to reduce the level of insufflation pressure and to use it only at the beginning of the operation. And that's the fact. The, the last paper from this team, the recent paper, uh, one year ago, the only difference was not uh, PE, CO2, pH, and so on. No, just operative time. And we, we, we know that operative time is longer with MIS than for open. This author, Bichet, measured the regional cerebral oxygen saturation using NIRS in six patients undergoing thoracoscopy. Acidosis was associated with a decrease in cerebral hemoglobin oxygen saturation, but the question is, are two or three hours the time for the operation with these conditions enough to damage the brain? We don't know anything about that. At low CO2 insufflation pressure around 5 mm mercury, the cerebral oxygen saturation remains stable. And that's what we do in Strasbourg, low flow, low pressure, and we use NIRS. What about patch and the survival rate? These are French series. Uh, when we use a patch, generally, that's because the, uh, you ha you, the, these are severe conditions, severe cases. And that's why you have more death in the patch series than without patch. You know, that's, that, that's probably the, the fact. And, and uh, some authors try to uh, decide to avoid a miss when the patient could need a patch closure. Uh, Zamashkari, for instance, um, has these factors associated with the need for patch closure, O2 saturation, CO2, initial arterial level, prematurity, Apgar score, and so on. And he said that these patients should be excluded from attempts to repair the CDH tricoscopically because patch closure entails technical difficulties. We have no, we are not good for that, and increases operative time. The question is, is stomach hernia actually a good predictor for the need for patch closure? Well, it may be, but it, it does not categorically predict conversion to an open repair. So that's difficult. And we, we try to operate them by an open way when we see that there is the uh, stomach up in the thorax. Chan said, when surgeons are deciding on treatment approach for CDH repair, the size of the defect and need for patch repair should be carefully considered. And during misrepair, if it becomes apparent that a patch will be required, the surgeon should strongly consider converting to an open procedure. And the question was asked during the meeting, the IPEG meeting in Japan, and the IPEG members concluded that the uh, one third would continue, one third would convert, and one third would decide only on the size of the defect. When the question was asked, need for patch closure, is it required to convert? The recurrence rate is the major problem with MIS, and it's a major problem, especially when we use a patch repair. That's catastrophic. <laughs> a large size defect and MIS approach were associated with higher rates of early recurrence. <laughs> because we are unable to do that uh, without any uh, training, you know, a good training. Uh, this series is uh, terrific. You know, there is a low experience, 40 ca 14 cases, and 43% of recurrence rate. Uh, and the Canadian surgeons uh, this year, two months ago, uh, wrote a minimally invasive surgery approach should not be used in the repair of neonatal CDH because of the high rates of recurrence. Well, you have some advantages for this length of this hospital stay, but the differences of loss are significant for stage A and B, but not really for the others. And the evaluation of the level of seriousness, stage A, B, C, D, is often approximate and always subjective. That's a problem too. Bravo. Uh, adhesive boil obstruction, we have more and more with open surgery and less and less with mist. That's a very good uh, thing. And, but it's true for stage A and B. You, it's not possible to compare. It's not statistically significant with stage C and D. So, and these are the more difficult cases. In we, it's a short series, but it's a very good question. When we decide thoracoscopy, when you decide thoracoscopy, 
you want to avoid any deformation of the thorax, you know. But in his series, there is no difference between the two groups, open or miss. Uh, scoliosis, funnel chest, and so on. <laughs> Thoracoscopy or laparoscopy, perhaps it's better with laparoscopy. We don't know. Well, by thoracoscopy, the advantages are, are obvious. CO2 is useful just at the beginning with a low flow, low pressure. The reduction of the hernia contents is easy. And the, the closure of the defect is easy because we have a wide operative field. And thanks to Olivier Reinberg, with this 15 years old uh, video, with laparoscopy, there are many disadvantages. You need CO2 always. It's always required. And sometimes it's, the level is very high. On this video, we can see 11, 12, 13 millimeter mercury of for the insufflation, that's very high. The reduction of the hernia contents is difficult, and the closure of the defect, where you work in a narrow operative field, so that's not uh, obvious, you know, to operate by this way. And when we compared with uh, Cindy Gomez Ferreira laparoscopy versus thoracoscopy, uh, the failure rate with laparoscopy was very high in, the, in our review, and the recurrence rate that is high with thoracoscopy is terrific with, lapar with laparoscopy, 41% of recurrence, that's, that's, that's why. So obviously we have to select the patients and we, we see that, we read that everywhere. This should not be the routine treatment for every neonate. The successful thoracoscopic repair can be expected in newborns which has limited respiratory compromise. And for instance, this open review, is excellent because she, 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 it proposes uh, the conditions, the selection criteria to choose, miss, or open. And we will certainly discuss again about this. Uh, we have this paper coming from China with his own criteria. This, that's very interesting because he said that CDH thoracoscopic repair can be performed safely and safely, safely, successfully, sorry, with these selection criteria. So we will discuss about these selection criteria. Um, this paper is interesting because cardiopulmonary status has to be stable under conventional uh, ventilation or HFO, and they test, they try the tolerance of manual ventilation to allow transfer from the ICU to the OR because it's very difficult to open with missed procedure in the ICU. It's quite uh, impossible. But, Probably it will be, but we have to organize everything and to have dedicated uh, uh, operative room in the ICU. So guidelines has to be written on this subject. For instance, you have to avoid miss for this unusual case with a pericardial uh, defect. After FITU, FITU plug and unplug, when you have a severe lung hypoplasia, when you have a de wide defect with stomach up, liver up, we, we don't try miss. And, but a question that is probably interesting, it's coming from our pediatricians in Strasbourg, is miss feasible with ECMO? I would say yes, but very rarely in these papers. Uh, but it may be useful in severe cases to maintain ETCO2 and pH level. So why not? Well, we have to discuss questions remain. Thoracoscopy for everybody, certainly not. To select the patients, that's obvious we have to do. And to improve our experience, please try simulation. And I just discovered recently a, a video. Uh, it will be on the web search site, uh, well, uh, the next month probably. It's coming from Maria Marcella Bailey Teams. It's an excellent video. And please discover this. And you have to, you need a very good training if you want to operate difficult cases uh, with CDH. So as it will, it's a serious advantage for easy case. I think we agree. But it's for this moment a lack of chance for severe CDH. Probably I will not be alive in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Francois. Very nice talk and uh, kind of provocative because if I listen to your talk, then in severe defects and large defects, so liver up, stomach up, no MIS, um, there's not much left for thoracoscopy. Is it so, Holger? Tell us the truth. <laughs> uh, 
Well, who knows the truth in this kind of business? Well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you all very, very much for, first of all, organizing this wonderful meeting of um, SPES, IPEC, and SPU. It's a wonderful format where we all probably learn as much as the audience. And thanks for the kind f moderation, Philip. And thanks, Francois, <laughs> for this wonderful talk. I just changed my first slide to saying, my dear friend Francois, thank you for this wonderful talk. I agree with you. We only need selection criteria, and then I am an MIS is certainly of benefit. I think you said so, didn't you? <laughs> Let me replicate a little bit and then tune you into um, MIS. I think Francois and I agree that a CDH is not a CDH is not a CDH, and Philip uh, Savai just said this said the same thing. There are the green ones, the yellow ones, and the uh, red ones in terms of anatomy and physiology. And the green ones, those with a minimal pulmonary hyperplasia, those with little pulmonary hypertension, and an excellent gas exchange on day one, they are probably the ones with the small defects. And throughout the talk, we will see those again, just like Francois said, as the perfect candidates for MIS. And Philip, because you asked, I think the red ones, the red ones are those that you mentioned, the liver ups, the right sided. There is a nice study from um, Augusto Zani during the UPSA conference. Um, would you do uh, CDH repair on ECMO? No. Would you do CDH repair with MIS after ECMO? No. Would you do the liver ups? Nope. And I think this speaks for the experience that we both share, uh, that these are the ones with the large defects. So the clinical spectrum, let's keep the green ones in mind. And yes, Francois, the anatomical spectrum matters. And honestly, that's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. You don't drive with a small car to buy the Christmas tree. You take something else, the technique must fit the patient and not the patient the technique. Very simple. That's a no-brainer in surgery after all. And meaning, if the patient fits the technique, we do something wrong. We must simply know which screw t driver to take for which screw, which suture to take for which task, and which approach to select for which kind of defect. And the study from Chan is beautiful, and Martin Metzeler just uh, produced something similar. It would be nice to know ahead of time which site and which size do we expect. And then, then we're one step ahead. Putnam, we'll, uh, you mentioned him and we'll, f we'll find him in my talk a couple of times. He has um, the data from two major studies. One is the US study, and one is an international study group for CDH. And Basically, with this slide, all I'm going to show is, yes, we have an anatomical spectrum. And the type A's, which are the little ones here, they have a nice posterior rim, they have a small defect. Even the type B's have some kind of, posterior, some kind of a posterior rim where you think, when you just suture it diagnosally, you may succeed. So we have a clinical spectrum and an anatomical spectrum, and similarly, we have a clinical problem and an anatomical problem. Indeed, we do. In 2013, Bichet, in, a January, in the January edition of the Annals of Surgery, he really stirred us up. Because in a very small group, just a pilot study, but a, a pilot study coming from Gosh, certainly one of the excellent centers in the world, <coughs> he concluded in 2013, these findings do not support the use of thoracoscopy with CO2 insufflation, calling into question whether this is a safe practice for our neonates. Wow. Madonna. <laughs> Porca miseria, or whatever else you say. In those days, we thought, well, pff, oops, we do have a problem. And indeed, then Niels came up, and all these measures how to um, uh, monitor cerebral oxygenation and many, many other things for the benefit of the child. So in 2013, we definitely had a clinical st uh, problem, and some people said, stop, stop it. We didn't, but we selected. 
And yes, we did, it, we did then have an anatomical problem. Like I mentioned, it's not the technique that fits the patient, it's the right patient for the right technique. Again, a no-brainer. And in 2011, Cao put together the United States data from 1995 to 2010. Early endpoint was very simple, reoperation rate, yes or no. Note these data in 2011, uh, 4,390 children with uh, CDH repair in the US, only 3.4 in 2011, Mark, whoa, hadn't been done per MIS, and then 12 of these uh, 151 recurred. So we had a recurrence rate of um, 8%, the open aged and matched and gestational age matched groups had only a 2.7% rate of recurrence, and clearly, the technique itself was inferior at those days. And honestly, just like Francois mentioned it, these um, problems persisted, persist, which means that still today in 2016, in surgery today, the Japanese group said, listen guys, less pain, shorter recovery rate, uh, length of hospital stay for a neonate with CDH, no, that's not his major concern. Maybe mother's, but not his, as a neonate. He doesn't care about going home a day early or not. He doesn't care about um, earlier enteral feeding. Of course, we do see a benefit of all that. But he cares about, will I have a problem from an uncontrolled malrotation? How big is the problem about hypercapnia and acidosis? And again, and that will be the final thing that we need to solve as MIS surgeons, the recurrence rate. Why don't we take a look at these three items step by step and just go by Albert Einstein. Failure, if we fail so far, is just the path to, prog uh, to progress to success. So let's progress and analyze. Yeah, volvulus. If the volvulus is a problem after CDH repair, no thoracoscopic or thoracotomy is of equivalent value. Agree? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you must go through the abdominal cavity. There's a nice study. We find studies for everything, of course, <laughs> like you said. In the JPS by 2017, Ward looked at uh, the American database and simply queried for neonates with uh, abdominal wall defects or CDH to compare the risk of volvulus before, no, with or without preemptive LADS procedure. So, some children got LADS procedure because all of these three pathologies have malrotation by definition, and some didn't. And the answer is very simple don't do LADS. No need to go through the abdomen. Overall, a LAD procedure during the index admission, so during the time that the child was corrected for either CDH, gastrochesis, or omphalocele. So the LADS procedure was associated with a higher risk for volvulus <laughs> and associated with a 3.2 increased odd ratio for future volvulus. So this is not one of our major concerns. Yes, we may go through the thorax and forget about the malrotation. First good news for thoracoscopy. And of course, I have to come back to acidosis and hypercapnia. We mentioned together the B-shaped paper in 2011. We mentioned following papers. You mentioned the nice paper from Agostino Piero when he moved. And here's another one from him, and um, similar to that in 2017. But let's go through it, Francois. And ask ourselves whether these children get acidosis and hypercapnia only because of thoracoscopy or also because of the pathology. Well, the Toronto group studied their sick, chick, uh, sick uh, kids' children, uh, their TEF and CDH repairs of thoracoscopic versus open. And I only brought the data so that the slide is not too busy um, of the um, CDH patients. And if you look, and that's, that's um, an use paired and unpaired test, so they paired the um, data, and basically both groups, open and thoracoscopic group, 
both groups developed intraoperative acidosis and hypercapnia. That means it's not the approach only. Of course, it's the pathology. It's mm -hmm. the bad lung in the green or in the yellow ones uh, that has less capability, less physiology uh, to blow off the CO2. And I agree with you that um, the, um, and that's what they conclude, that these phenomena were of course severer in the thoracoscopic groups, but regardless of the approach, both suffer from it. And we learned, like you said, to only use the gas at the very initial seconds. And maybe one day we'll learn not to use CO2 at all to um, decrease this so-called disadvantage. But the message of this slide is it's not only the thoracoscopic people. It's also the, th uh, the open children neonates that, ha that suffer from acidosis and hypercapnia. So to my mind, we're left with recurrence. In 2017 in the JPS, again Putnam, now from the international con um, uh, CDH study group, looked at um, 3,000, uh, almost 4,000 patients, uh, 3,300 for patch repair, and notes um, that uh, 2.3 patients had an early recurrence. I omitted all the rest of the data and just brought you the summary. The, summary. the larger defects, remember for my first graph, these C and D defects have an odd ratio of four or even seven, so four times or seven times higher chance um, to experience recurrence. And an MIS approach introduces an odds ratio of 3.24 at higher recurrence rate. So these were the only independent predictors of recurrence, large size and MIS. Where does that bring us to? Well, I think we both agree. If large size is a problem, exclude large size. If MIS has a technical problem, improve your technique. <laughs> Isn't that so? So, select your MIS patients, select them with the right knowledge, with good education, with Francois studies and others like Chan, imagine the uh, size of the defect, improve your skills, will, which indeed I agree with that, still are worse than open, increase your technical abilities and skills. So this slide is obvious, don't fight the big ones. Select defect size only then, does that help us? Nope, again, we have to work on our techniques because if, if you look at Putnam in his final study recently from 2017, um, again, of course, we know that he's working a lot in that field. He compared CDH patients, note the um, immense, mark the immense um, uh, MIS uh, increase in the US now down, now up to 16% in this study and what basically what he did is, if you have a multivariable regression and you adjust for defect size and keep patient characteristic, so you adjust for the size, then MIS still, still um, has an increased recurrence rate. But some benefits, length of hospital stay, decreased small bowel obstruction, okay? So if you adjust for the size, if the size is not a matter anymore, and you still have an increase in recurrence rate, it must be technique. It must be technique. I almost, I can almost conclude, um, and I think then we agree and disagree, hopefully a little bit, so it's um, a nice match for the audience. Um, I think one of the nicest paper recently being published is that from Rene Wine and his group uh, talking about this selection criteria. Um, and um, I'll go to his algorithm in a minute and then I'll show a few videos uh, to add up. Um, what he basically summarizes is everything uh, Francois and I said. The green ones, one of my first slides, are those that are hemodynamically and pulmonary stable. They have a mean arterial pressure of 30 to 40, they have equivalent preductal saturations. Um, they have a lactate below three, urine output above two millimeter, more than two millimeter per kilogram an hour, and not the ECMOs and uh, not those with the pneumothorax. 
I think we all agree that these, especially when they have a liver down, like Philip said, that they are good candidates for thoracoscopy. Thoracoscopy, to just make sure that you understand the size of the defect. If good preoperative management and diagnostics prove that you already have a type C or D defect despite the uh, stability, probably you don't need thoracoscopy. How do we all do it? Um, patient on the um, contralateral, which is the healthy side, I agree. Three ports, only three or 3.5 millimeters, short instruments, little or no gas insufflation, and careful reduction. And so we start just with a thoracoscopy. Beautiful instruments are these rotor locks because they don't use any space in this tight cavity anyway. They are locked in, sutured from the outside, and these are 3.5. And any resident, any consultant, even for us, don't you agree, my friend Francois, these moments are the most beautiful ones, aren't they? Gentle, almost no touch, open, non-traumatic instruments, you just push everything back and you're happy that you don't see any spleen, any stomach, no liver. Ah, this is a beautiful one. And at this point, you accept that this is a small defect, correct? Small defect, nice posterior rim. So we're down here, thoracoscopy, feasible, and this is the decision that you have to make. Is the patient feasible for the thoracoscopic repair, and are you feasible? for the thoracoscopic repair. We will have the questions later, which kind of suture, uh, which kind of needle, uh, but again, this is important to me. Here you come in, because we said it's still something wrong with the technique. Mm -hmm. And as much as we talk here, the people outside listening to us have to ask themselves, am I able to do that, what they say, or am I not? Okay. We'll continue with that patient, small size. <coughs> Just appreciate yourself. Do you think you can do it? Hey. <laughs> I think this looks very similar to an open approach. Um, whether you patch them additionally or not, uh, it's up to you. Nice bites, non-absorbable, braided sutures, at least a 3.0. The needle is bent so that you bring it through the trocar into the chest, and there is no tension on this diaphragm at all. As always, note this stitch. As always, the last defect that you have to take care of, or the first one, the most complicated is the one back here in the posterior corner. The posterior side is up, correct? But like an open surgery, it is even easier to have a transcostal stitch. This is the rib. You just need a stab incision of about one millimeter. You bring the needle into one side, you shift the skin to the other side, and you come out with it. I personally believe that this is a fair and sufficient and safe primary closure of a type A defect, a small defect indeed. Yeah, finally, the cool guys in the gang will say, ah, that's a nice operation, anybody can do that. What about patches? And here, here we go, patch repair. You know, I'm a German, and I was trained in Germany over years by the Mannheim group, which probably have the most experience and the best guys in the country, probably in Europe as well, that the patch has to be like a hut, like a hat. Okay, it has to be redundant. It has to be an extra shape. Well, that's hard to do for the thoracoscopic people. And if they remain right, then we have to talk about that technique as well. The way to do a patch repair, in my uh, experience, is you close one or two sutures only. 
don't go for tension to decrease the size of the defect. No, you stop before you have tension on these leaves. If one is fine, good. If two is fine, fine. But then go early enough, as long as this is still loose, go early enough for the patch, bring it in through one trocar, you just roll it, use the material, use the material you always use, and then tie it in else you always tie it in. What I'm trying to say is that a patch repair should be a patch repair, no matter whether it's open or thoracoscopically. A loose patch into the loose ends. Make up your own mind whether we are able enough to suture in such a small space. And of course the final and the most um, troublesome corner is the, again the posterior corner. I showed you the transcostal rib stitch yeah. before. Why not use it on the patch as well? So you make a stab incision of about one millimeter on the skin, just above the rib, then you shift the skin to one side, bring in the needle. So you shift the skin to the other side, bring out the needle through the same skin incision, and then you tie it just under the skin. I don't see a point where this patch should not hold as an as in uh, laparotomy. So this brings me to my conclusion. Does selection improve outcome? Yes, it does. I don't think we're, that we're there yet. We probably select better and more sincere. But if you look at the Ann Arbor group, um, Chris, in a just recent publication, he looked at, at the Ann Arbor pa uh, patient from 6 to 16, and he excluded the bad ones. So he only went and this summarizes everything that Francois and I said for the moment, he only approached the type A's and the type B's by thoracoscopy, he excluded uh, the smallies and the ECMO patient. Most of his patients, two thirds, received thoracoscopic uh, the thoracoscopic procedure, and he finally says, in low risk patients born with a small to moderate de size defect, thoracoscopy was associated with decreased length of hospital stay, time to feeding and still a slightly higher recurrence rate but not dramatically as you can see by the data. With this ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, <laughs> ladies hopefully on the outside world and the web, I may summarize. I think Francois and I almost agree, MIS is great. <laughs> <laughs> to repair newborns because yes it is absolutely feasible technically it reduces, uh, it definitely requires education and elaborate surgical skills, which I mentioned. Critical patient selection, that's something we can still work on, uh, is mandatory to identify the A's and B's, and then go stepwise. Put in the thoracoscope, assess the defect, assess the herniated organs. Once you have reduced successfully and you think it is a type A or B, and you think that you are technically able to do it without any major complications, and I agree with you, in a decent amount of time, not within three hours, yeah. then suture it. Despite all this patient selection, yes, recurrence remains an issue. There is something beyond um, anatomy that is technique and probably we do need other patches, or at least we must go back to the open way of fashioning patches and use them thoracoscopically as well. And uh, these uh, rates of recurrence, they need to, uh, to be observed in the future. But I think uh, such excellent colleagues that are here today with all their uh, minimal invasive surgical skills will have that in a couple of years and then we can offer an even better. So I quote with Einstein, let's progress to success, and I thank you very much for the attention. So thank you, Holger. Uh, overwhelming talks about a very complex um, subject, CDH. Before we go into um, details of discussion, we got some questions from the internet. Um, Mahmoud uh, Maklev Ardan, he wants to know, is double lumen ventilation necessary or mandatory for um, surgery? No, in fact, we don't use this kind of ventilation. It, it's not useful, you know, because the only 
long that is working is the opposite long. So we, ha we have to conserve this long. It's impossible to, uh, uh, to avoid the vent good ventilation on the right side, for instance, for, instance, for left-sided hernia. And on the, on the left side, well, the, the lung is collapsed. We have uh, an, a severe hyperplasia. So we don't need anything to collapse the lung. The lung is, the lung is collapsed, you know. So there is no need, no, uh, well, it doesn't exist, a double lumen tube for neonates. But if it does exist, it's not useful at all. I don't know. I fully agree. We're talking about neonates and it's, it's not necessary. You won't find a double lumen tubus, tubus for neonates. And uh, we all agree that you should not fool around with bronchial blockers at that age. You have a hypoplastic lung on that side where you operate. That's the real benefit and beauty of thoracoscopy and uh, no need for any intertracheal interventions. The, the same colleague wants to know what kind of patch you're using. Oh, that's, that's a very good question because the problem we have a patch now, we have different kind of patch. Uh, for us, we use the Gore-Tex patch. Uh, double face, uh, but um, certainly it's not the good patch. It's a patch for the for the past, you know. And w at this moment, um, one of our colleagues, um, Anne Schneider, on the team of uh, uh, are doing a research about um, patch that could be integrated with cells in the thorax and the abdomen in order to have. Well, many years later, quite a normal diaphragm. Because you have to consider that your patch is a little patch for a newborn, but the size of this diaphragm has to uh, grow, to increase five to six times until the, uh, the, the, the adult age. Mm -hmm. So that's enormous. And we don't have, for the moment, a good patch that can grow. It doesn't exist. Well, for little patches like you, you well, like we use, use usually, well, the muscle will grow and not the patch. But when we have to replace quite all the diaphragm for those children who are very severe cases coming from plug and unplug treatment in prenatal uh, period, for instance, for these patients, we have no good solutions for this moment. I think this is an important remark. You agree, Holger? Ah, fully. Um, in Graz, I had the privilege of uh, working with Amulia Saxena doing um, all kinds of tissue engineering on uh, CDH, CH plastics. At the end of the day, uh, just like Francois said, there will be a clever patch that grows. But as long as throughout life from a neonate uh, to an adolescent, the diaphragm increases its size, its size by six times, you need some kind of a material that either stretches or grows, or you put in a patch and you have to replace it. That is simple biology, that is uh, biomechanics. And uh, I think uh, that the first thing that you need to do as a surgeon in the neonatal is to make it as redundant as possible, as big as possible. And there are data for that. Um, the time for recurrence between the open group and the thoracoscopic group is different, meaning the open group has a later recurrence in their series than the thoracoscopic. Why? Well, because the, the size of the patch is bigger in, in open group, and it takes longer for it to flatten out and then to tear out. When you have a small patch, this happens earlier. And I think that's one, some of the tendency that uh, must be solved for thoracoscopy. Are there, another question from the internet is, are there any alternatives to fix the patch instead of sutures? Very short question, because we get overwhelmed with comments on Facebook, on our own chat. Um, I got a bunch of more questions for you guys. Nah, um, how? Like, you know, there are many, many, many different um, uh, toys around in the, um, for, <laughs> toys around for um, surgery in the adolescence, uh, tuckers and whatever else. These are all huge instruments that don't apply to neonates. We're talking about neonates with a small thor uh, thoracic cavity 
and uh, just make sure that you use the same suture, suture that you use open. Yeah. There is a tendency, because the needles and the sutures don't fit through these 3 or 3.5 millimeter drawcars, to even go beyond that. And that's another risky factor. Uh, if you are used to do a 3 hour suture, and now all of a sudden you use a 5 hour because you don't have the curved needle, don't do that. Those 5 hours tear easily. Um, just bend the needle. So if I spend some time on techniques in 2018, I'm waiting for Francois and the growing patch, until then, I make sure that I have the same skills yeah. and the same technique as open. So Iftikhar Yan from, I guess, Pakistan wants to know, can we determine the size of the defect preoperatively? That's the most important question. Um, sometimes we are so disappointed because we, uh, we are sure we will, have, we will meet a very severe, a very large defect. So we abandon <laughs> miss, yeah. and uh, we the, the the patient stays in the ICU, and we operate it, him uh, or her uh, by an open way. But we discover the defect is not so important. So there are many many errors. That's very difficult. And I was uh, speaking about the stomach up, but sometimes the stomach up it means that the defect is huge, and generally it means. But in some cases, you may have the stomach up, but a little defect. And in these cases, are you, that's uh, terrific to, <laughs> to choose an open way, because for a little defect, I uh, totally agree, this is perfect for us. Beside the fact that Darius Podkowski, our dear colleague from Poland, is congratulating us uh, through <laughs> our chat to do this masterclass. Thank you, Darius, if, you jo if you're still joining us. Um, this uh, colleague Jan, he wants also to know, are you testing um, the positioning of the patient in terms of lying him on the lateral um, position prior to the operation to see how he's doing and how we might deal with the operation? Yes, we do. We try. When we are sure, we can perform miss surgery, but we're not really sure. So we try. The tolerance of the child uh, just lying on the lateral decubitus, just this. And if it doesn't go well, we abandon the idea to perform this. Uh, but once more, the question I asked at the beginning, at the end of my topic was probably, because the pediatricians agree with that, they are interested by that, probably if we try ECMO, probably we can do more, more difficult cases with ECMO in the ICU, with the miss, perhaps we could try for these babies that the, who are uncomfortable and very bad as, uh, in a, uh, lateral decubitus. You, you know what I mean? Mm. So uh, perhaps it, it may improve their conditions and perhaps it may be possible to perform, to propose, to offer miss, but for the moment it's not possible. But that's a question. I have no answer about that. Algo, you disagree? First time I get a chance to really disagree. <laughs> 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 because Francois' talk was just perfect. <laughs> and I think he will agree with me too. No, Francois. ECMO, ECMO, just to make MIS possible, is not the right way to go. Because we, I think we learned that ECMO, these ECMO children have a really high chance to have a bad, big defect. And we said that the size of the defect, the C's and the D's, are those that are almost uncontrollable for MIS. So just because you bring in ECMO and make it possible for the MIS surgeons to go ahead will create a bigger problem for the MIS surgeons when they see the defect. No, I think, very clear answer, those children that do not tolerate positioning on the left side or on the right side, depending on where you are, for MIS, are not the right candidates. Um, René Weinen and his team made it clear, only the stable ones, the stable neonates, will be the ideal candidates for the next years until we solve some of these technical problems, because they will most likely, most likely translate into smaller defects. And with our skills, with your skills, out there in the world, you will be able to suture them without a recurrence, or with less recurrence. And that's the way to go. Okay. Picking this up, talking about the right side, Holger, <laughs> Dr. Uh, 
Udayula Khan. I don't know where, where she is or he is from. So in this uh, meaning, I ask kindly all participants on the internet to identify themselves and also their countries and their institutions they come from. But um, this colleague wants to know, what is the hurdle of going to the right side? I guess the MIS approach, um, is there a hurdle? We have a very bad idea about right-sided hernias, mm -hmm. but that's not true. Half uh, of them will die, probably, but the others, they're exactly as, as uh, left-sided hernias. You have very easy <laughs> cases. And one of my, my videos was a right-sided hernias, just to, <laughs> to fight a little bit I more. <laughs> I admire you. I never... <laughs> and, uh, well, that's possible. Well, it, when, you, when the liver is down, it's visible. It's exactly mm -hmm. as uh, for the left-sided hernias. So it's not forbidden to operate using MIS, uh, the right-sided hernias, I think. Yeah. Again, true, but... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's very simple, but. We know that the um, uh, prognosis of right-sided CDH patients is much worse Again, choose your battles right. Yeah. Choose the right patient for the, um, uh, the choose the right technique for the right patient, and as soon as the liver is up, you are into a much more difficult uh, operation, and um, it has nothing to do with the skills, but with the position of the liver, with yeah. positioning it into the right space, uh, with uh, venous and portal venous flow, and so on. So careful with the right sides, and we know this for years. This is old tradition in pediatric surgery. Thanks. So both of you, would you put a chest drain in? This question comes from Mr. Dustin from Slovakia. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. No need for a chest drain. Also, chest drain. Chest, chest drain. Well, for, for me, that's Short not answer. necessary. But our pediatricians sometimes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Short answer. Uh, sorry, I, I missed the microphone. For us, it, well, for me, uh, it's not necessary to have a dry, to any drainage, but. For pediatrician, in some difficult cases, they say probably we may have, we may encounter a chylothorax for some days, just for, for a few days. And so please leave, give us the possibility to drain, but they will use it with a very low pressure exsufflation. And so in some, in the easy cases, we don't leave any drainage. But for the more difficult cases, we leave a drainage because we know that it may be useful for, for the, uh, the next days. Important, no suction. Okay. No if suction. You, if you have suction, you uh, have barotrauma, you try yeah, to two, three, extend three. the lung. Yeah, it right. looks nice on the x-ray yeah. the next day and it's terrible for the parenchymal yeah, so lesions. No, if you put in a drain, don't, no suction. Yeah. So, so to answer totally the question... Right. Never leave a drain or sometimes leave a drain depends on I don't individual care. Sometimes I um, leave a drain without any suction. But never no. use suction. No. Well, great. There's a question from uh, Dublin, Ireland, from oh. Ahmed Abdulrahman. How frequently and for what cases would you use a muscle flap? Some? A muscle flap? <laughs> uh, muscle. The, the muscle <laughs> flap is not feasible using MIS, so, but yes, we did. We used this technique and um, well, the result is very interesting for the, for the diaphragm. The neo-diaphragm is uh, done with the transverse muscle and it's, uh, it's a good muscle, uh, alive, uh, with nerve, uh, vessels and so on. That's good. But when you see these patients uh, 15, 20 years later, that's very important, the follow-up in pediatric surgery. And you, it, it, you have something like um, an eventration, you know, mm. and that's not nice. And they say, well, what is possible? We, we want you repair that. That's not nice. And I totally agree. And that's, that's the major problem we encountered. That, that is why we abandoned this technique. I don't know. Again, I have a very clear idea of that. Um, you, we're talking about the D defects, a pleasure of one-sided diaphragm. As a neonate, never a muscle flap. Put in a patch and go home. Wait. Then the patch will tear out at the age of one or two. Again, not yet time for a muscle flap. Put in a bigger patch and go home, <laughs> especially the child. 
The muscle flap, if you take the latissimus dorsi flap, this is for older children, school age children, or maybe even adolescents if you can wait that long. Otherwise, the muscle flap will tear as well, and um, it is not possible, uh, especially in the neonate or infant uh, time, to do an adequate perfusion of the muscle flap. I would warn for that. Okay. Another question from Pakistan. Which approach? Um, we know the most common um, hernia is the Bokdalek hernia, but in case of a Morgani hernia, which approach would you prefer? Laparoscopic, thoracoscopic, open? <laughs> This um, question is from, I don't know, I don't know the name of this participant, but it's from Mudassar from Pakistan. He makes us happy. Okay, so for the Morgani hernia, we, we decide uh, laparoscopy, but not thoracoscopy for these uh, hernia, of course. These are the beautiful cases. If you have 10, I come. <laughs> All right. Um, again, from Iftikar Yan, um, another question. Which, um, what do you do, do you do with the hernia sac in case you encounter one? Excise it, leave it, just plicate it? Mm -hmm. what, what's your preferable? Uh, at the beginning, we, we tried to remove it, but I, I think that that's not a good idea. We can damage nerves, uh, and in fact, it's very useful because if you plicate it and just add a, a patch if, you need, if it is needed, that, that may be a better option than to remove the sac and you may encounter new difficult conditions because uh, the uh, small bowel will go up and so on and so on. So it seems to be easier and uh, more sure than uh, when you remove the sac. I would, I would I certainly agree with that, with one addition. I think throughout the last years uh, we learned um, that you need um, to incise the pleura or at least cauterize it to induce healing. And if you leave the hernia sac as it is, the likelihood of recurrence is higher because there is no healing of the epithelium. Yeah. So, Francois, if you leave it, at least you need to incise it and cauterize it so that healing can add to healing. Yeah. I don't know what Mark says and the others. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I've started cauterizing around it as well. Mm -hmm. Another question, because you raised uh, the issue of chylothorax postoperatively, so there's a question from Mr. Dustin from Slovakia again. Um, how often are you observing that, that kind of problem and how, you, how do you deal with it? Well, it's, a, it's not for a long time. These are not chylothorax as we can have prenatal chylothorax that has to be drained and drained and sometimes proposed to surgery after, after a few weeks of life. No, these chylothorax are something, I, I don't understand exactly the mechanism of these chylothorax, but it, uh, it is just for well, uh, one week, one week and a half, and we have nothing to do more than the drainage, low drainage. Okay, Volga? Agree. No comment anymore? Well, then I conclude this topic. Yes. Uh, just, just I, I would like to, to show this um, reconstruction of the, uh, just for, <laughs> <laughs> this is a reconstruction for a patch after a patch repair. This is a Mannheim patch repair, yeah. like a little hat, mm -hmm. Chinese hat, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. okay. And the, 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 we hope that we will be able to do that to fix this kind of uh, patch in a short future Beautiful. using miss, but it's not possible for the moment. <laughs> Thank you. All right, then you there's agree? one more question from my co-chairman, Mario. In your opinion, we're talking about recurrence and all these problems with miss, but uh, it's important to know which areas of technology, in your opinion, should need to evolve or to improve in order to decrease this type of complications in, in minimal invasive surgery. Where do you think technically, from instrumentation and quality of sutures and everything, what do you think are the main things that should improve? In fact, we improve the quality of our, our suture just removing the trocars, because we don't need trocars at all, just for the beginning, for the reduction of the hernia contents, and after that, CO2 is not uh, useful, and trocars are not useful too. So, 
And so it becomes very easy. With truckers, it is difficult uh, through the thoracic wall, but without any truckers, it's very easy. To well, my mind, I think we try to point it out. Um, MIS is just an approach. It's just a way to get there. And if recurrence is obviously dependent on the size of the form of the patch, what Francois just showed is one of the most important areas of technology development. And that is how to form the same patches as we do in open, how to get them in, and how to suture them right. And if that is solved, I'm sure that in a couple of years we will be sitting here and we will be talking about the more elaborate steps, but this is the first steps that need to be done so that the MIS surgeons are as good as the open surgeons. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. So I would love to... Congratulations. I love you. <laughs> so there's some agreement in the end. Um, I'm happy to, to see this. You did it very well, um, Philip. So Thanks to conclude Philip. this part of the session, I would like to thank you very much for your talks, and uh, I would like to thank the participants who were sending questions all over the time. And I would love to let you know that there were comments from Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, um, India, Pakistan, Slovakia, um, Ireland, um, what else? Um, yeah, and some of them we couldn't identify because they didn't um, give us um, um, their institutions and informations, but um, I think it's, it was of great interest throughout the world, and thank you again. And now I hand over to my good friend Ala Egonemi, who will guide us through urology. Ala. Thanks to you, Philip, for this kind moderation. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to thank François Wickmer for so many years that he has been always a great support and with their CAD for teaching in pediatric urology, which is minimal invasive pediatric urology really owes you a lot in teaching. Uh, and on behalf of the ASPU, I would like also to thank the ISPES and the IPIG to uh, let us share this wonderful event uh, this year. We have uh, a very controversial uh, subject, one of the most controversial subject in uh, pediatric urology uh, current, in current days, which is the treatment of reflux. And uh, for this, that's why we went very far and we chose two uh, big expert, international expert, of reflux and minimal invasive surgery in pediatric urology. The first one is uh, Ram uh, Sobramanian. Ram is uh, the chief of pediatric urology at Leeds Children's Hospital in the United Kingdom. He has been the chairman of the educational committee of the SPU for uh, eight years. He is uh, currently the General Secretary of the ASPU, and he is a professor at the University of Ghent. Uh, he is, uh, of course, one of the world-known experts in treatment of uh, vesicoloteric reflux. And uh, besides, we will uh, have our uh, professor, uh, François Varlet, who is the, uh, representing the ISPES. And he is uh, the uh, uh, head of department of uh, pediatric surgery and urology at Saint Etienne University in France. He is uh, the current president of the French Society of Pediatric Surgery, and he, uh, he is the ex president of the National Academy of Pediatric Surgery in France. He will also give his opinion on the treatment of reflux. So we will start with Ram. He's going to give us. Uh, a very detailed controversy and his opinion on endoscopic, open, or robotic treatment of reflux, or not to treat at all. And then uh, Francois who will give us his uh, pioneer experience in laparoscopic extravesical reimplantation. So, um, thank you very much, Allah. Uh, for the invitation and the, and, the, and the very kind introduction, I have to say. I'm not so sure that I am such a world expert 
Um, but thank you anyway, and thank you to um, the IRCAR organizers for this amazing venue and the and the setup for us to be able to do such a, a web-based um, education module. Um, I, I'm not so sure that we're actually going to have major controversies, um, um, really, uh, because I think the reflux uh, treatment options um, has sort of plateaued, if I, in my opinion, in the last five or six years. And I think the only new thing that's probably come in is uh, the use of the robotics for the management of reflux. So um, one thing I want to say before I get started is that the, we know much more about how to treat reflux before we understand the pathophysiology of reflux. And so we are still having some problems understanding um, the actual dynamics what happens in reflux and its management. Nevertheless, the most important thing to is to start off what used to happen traditionally for then for us to understand how things have changed. So when reflux was diagnosed, I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago, traditionally they were placed on antibiotic prophylaxis. And as long as they had no further urinary tract infections, the antibiotic prophylaxis was maintained to an undefined age, which usually between three to five years, and then we stopped the antibiotic prophylaxis, and with no further infections, they were considered as cured, and therefore stopped the antibiotic prophylaxis. If they had breakthrough infections while on prophylaxis, or they got infections post stoppage of the antibiotics, then they went in for a ureteric reimplantation. That was a traditional approach. What's important is that too much emphasis has been placed on grades of reflux. Let us focus a bit in the sense that reflux by itself is only a radiological sign and it's not a disease. And therefore, clinical manifestations of reflux vary. And we all know the grade one to grade five reflux, but it's only between the grade three, four, and five where the urinary tract is actually dilated. There is a time that's come in to understand the difference between non-dilating and dilating reflux. And it's also important because when you have non-dilating reflux, the success rates in terms of spontaneous resolution is much higher compared to reflux when it is three, four, and five. There are significant pitfalls in understanding reflux because, as I said, much emphasis is placed on grades and the success or failure of treatment modality in most publications is just on, based on grades, particularly in the 90s. As a result, clinical manifestations were largely ignored because various clinical groups exist and the difficulty is knowing what is reflux nephropathy. And I think a rational approach would be to, to, to treat or to consider major reflux with dilatation compared to non-dilated reflux. What is the rate of spontaneous resolution and how does a DMSA scare, uh, sorry, scan, uh, scan look in terms of scars and function? Now, reflux nephropathy coexists in a large proportion of children, but the reflux with a recurrent infection is a real problem with the risk of progressive renal damage. We also know that reflux can be either acquired or congenital. And congenital reflux usually does not present with the infections. They have fairly high-grade reflux, and DMSA usually demonstrates dysplasia. Compared to infective scarring, where there is severe urinary tract infections with intrarenal reflux, and the virulence of the organism matters, with maximum risk being less than two years of age. So based on reflux, there are subtypes in terms of prenatal diagnosis or the diagnosis later on in life. But it's important also to understand that's a male preponderance in congenital scars compared to female preponderance in acquired scars. And it's also important to understand that the bladder and the bowel play a bigger role in acquired scars compared to congenital scars. So there are risk factors 
for high risk of scars and low risk of scars. Now we come to management of surgical management, particularly of reflux. This paper by Ruth talks about what's known on the subject, that it's common, it's controversial. And for those patients who deem to be candidates of surgical intervention, we're not sure whether we should be reimplantation or endoscopic uh, correction. And the factors underlying these were unclear. So they looked at a cohort of 15,000 children, of which 24% were treated hospitals that performed reimplantation only. And among children treated in institutions where they offered both procedures, endoscopic correction or reimplantation, there was a 50 50 split. And patients who re received endoscopic correction were much older and were more likely to be girls. So, this study actually shows that the hospital a patient attends was the single most important factor influencing what procedure they underwent. And age, gender, and insurance played a smaller but significant role. Now, when it comes to endoscopic correction, that changed the game forever in the 90s. What it does is essentially provide a bulb lull mechanism and increasing the intramural length of the ureter. I think the question of which bulking agent used to use has been rested in the sense that deflux is the only available agent that's FDA approved and it's biodegradable. The other materials that you can see in the picture don't look very appealing and I don't think anybody much is using these days non-biodegradable materials. I'm just going to spend a few minutes in demonstrating to you the technique of reflux uh, uh, for, from an endoscopic correction perspective. And what we need to understand is the evaluation of the bladder, the first instance by a cystoscope is most important. We must explain to our theatre staff not to open the deflux prior to have assessed this bladder because it's an expensive material. We must be carefully try and observe with hydro distension as to how the ureteric orifices look. I think it's very important to mention that when you want to do an endoscopic correction, the bladder needs to be half full or half empty as you would prefer to use the terminology. Here you can see the hydro distension causing the ureteric orifice to open and that's how we assess whether we can admit the scope or not and therefore dictate the technique. We assess both the ureteric orifices irrespective of there is bilateral reflux or not. Sometimes you can be sure that there is constipation by looking at the bowel prominence just in the area of the trigon and that can give a clue as to if this patient is going to have recurrent infections or not. It's important to start with the bevel of the needle facing upwards and in this case, I chose to go suburetric in the first instance. And you can see that we very carefully, very gently inject small volumes to begin with. And then we have to adjust the needle sometimes so that it sits in the right place. The aim of the, or the end point of the procedure is a satisfactory mount with an open wide orifice to have been transformed into a crescent shaped orifice. You can see how the deflux mound is actually stabilized the ureteric orifice and it increases the intramural length as we saw in the graphic picture in the previous slide. Once we are satisfied the mount is in place, it's important to keep the needle in place for at least 15 seconds. Early removal of this needle will cause leakage. And once the surgeon is happy that the needle, that the mound has set, then there is no harm in taking the needle out very carefully. Obviously, as you can see here, I've been very cautious, but I've been taking my time to make sure that I'm happy with what's with the mound. And then you gently withdraw the needle. And you can see how the mound is sat in that place with the crescent shaped orifice. There's a little bit of deflux in the front, but that's okay. In this case, I'll be, I'll be showing you how, I just wanted to make sure for demonstration purposes that there is no obstruction. 
And so I did pass in a ureteric catheter to make sure that it passes through easily. This next video I'm going to demonstrate to you is about the role in redo cases. So when endoscopic correction has failed, can you still try repeat endoscopic correction? The answer is yes, because a number of times you find that the implant has migrated or it's not in the right place. When I do redo cases, I prefer to have a ureteric catheter to begin with so that I know exactly where I'm going with it. And often even in primary cases, it's useful to have it but that can tend to the ureteric orifice upwards and allows precise placement of the needle and therefore um, create a satisfactory mound. I would like to emphasize one point here. The volume of injection is not as important compared to the appearance of the mound. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Why endoscopic correction? Because in good alternative to antibiotic prophylaxis, the technique is standardized, there are safe materials available, can be an outpatient procedure, and it's cost effective, and it's pretty easy on the child. When it comes to surgical options, we have the standard cross trigonal ureteric reimplantation. And actually, the true standard is not really cross trigonal, but what you do is just move the ureters across the field under a good submucosal tunnel, which has stood the sets of time. And depending upon if you have a pediatric surgical background training or your urological training, you would do a cross trigonal or you an extravasical Leach Gregory implantation, which most urological surgeons prefer. But you could do either, and the next video is going to demonstrate to you how this can be done by the robotic approach. So you can see the ureter that's been mobilized at the extravasical region. You would do a cross trigonal or you an extravasical Leach Gregory implantation, which most urological surgeons prefer. But you could do either. The next video is going to. But you can see a detrusorotomy. A detrusorotomy um, has been made at the vesica ureteric junction, and the ureter is now being anchored the top of the incision so that we can have a satisfactory submucosal tunnel. This is a case of bilateral ureteric reimplantation with recurrent urinary tract infections. It's a very straightforward procedure when you do it robotically and the most important thing is the access to the vesicular ureteric junction which is much more difficult when you were to do it either an open or laparoscopic approach. I think laparoscopically you can access it, but robotically is just fantastic. This video demonstrates to you post endoscopic correction and here is where the maximum utility of a robotic approach comes in. Look how easy it is to identify the vesica ureteric junction, create a detrusorotomy as satisfactorily as you wish, identify the deflux in the ureter, There, just out there, you can is free the deflux of the ureteric wall, and then you create a detrusorotomy tunnel, and then I'm measuring here this length of the, the diameter of the ureter, and I go three times into detrusorotomy, so I'm comfortable that I have an adequate submucosal tunnel. And again, the robot provides a ease with which this whole anastomosis can be performed and the whole operation on an average does not take more than 45 to 60 minutes including docking and port placements. Once it's a very standardized approach and the peritoneum is reposited. Post bilateral reimplantation you can see the bladder looks good, the kidneys upper tract are fine and there is no problems of dilatation of the ureters. I just want to put a word about circumcision in normal boys, there is a risk of about 1% and therefore you are going to treat more than 100 children or you could circumcise more than 100 boys to for a benefit. But with recurrent urinary tract infections, if you treat or if you circumcise more than 10 boys, you would have made a difference. But in severe high-grade reflux, 
where the risk of urinary tract recurrence is 30%, you just have to circumcise four boys and you make a difference. And therefore, circumcision does have a role in surgical management options. But the most important thing is that we need to clinically uh, stratify these patients into a risk model. And it's quite clear that the incidence of urinary tract is higher when the patient's on a higher risk. There are follow-up issues. In the short term, when do you stop antibiotic prophylaxis? How do you image these patients? In the longer term, what is the criteria and the duration of the follow-up? And how do you manage asymptomatic children with unresolved or downgraded reflux? We need to have a universal definition of success because clinical success is more meaningful to the patient. And initial radiographic suction success rather, could be followed by infection requiring further inter intervention. But it's quite clear from majority of the series that a, irrespective of the type of free implantation, there's a very good success rate and a low complication rate. So in the endoscopic era, what's more important is, can we reduce the number of Miss histograms that we performed in these patients because post reimplantation ordinarily we wouldn't because the febrile urinary tract rate is quite low so we could we could try and avoid um, doing VCUGs um, and also in those patients who have got lower risk factors we could stop antibiotic prophylaxis and observe. One of the imaging modalities is, is ultrasound scan, and you can see a mound here, post-endoscopic correction. But I must caution you that you should not rely on the mound because some papers have quite clearly demonstrated that you cannot say that because there's a mound, reflux is resolved. But most important thing is, in a randomized trial of over 10-year period, it's quite important to understand that the decision of an appropriate treatment depend upon the local expertise and on anticipated compliance of the patient. The renal growth and urinary tract reference were similar, irrespective of treatment modality, except that medically treated patients had more febrile infections. And in this same trial, there was no evidence over a 10-year period of any significant difference between medical or surgical management in relation to acquisition of new scars or to renal growth and function, provided they are well monitored and there's a regime for close observation and collaboration between um, consultants and primary care providers. And when medical factors do not clearly favor medical or surgical management, family preferences should be respected. And it's expected that most children will do well in the longer term. And I talked to you about risk factors. We must find out whether they have bladder bowel dysfunction, what's the age of the patient, the sex, do they have infections? Are they recurrent infections? And what about scarring? So you can stratify them into high risk or low risk, as the case may be. And then individualize the management. And I think in early grade reflux, when there is no clinically symptomatic um, or clinically symptom, relevant symptoms, you can conservatively manage. Or in the very high grade reflux, you may consider reimplantation. But endoscopic uh, injection or correction significantly plays a role in this area between grade two to grade four, predominantly in grade three, particularly in older girls who've got lower urinary tract symptoms and um, who've got um, infections. And to finish off, I would like to say that we have a model in Leeds where we have a dedicated reflux clinic with a urologist, nephrologist, and a clinical nurse specialist we have facilities available for bladder scanner, pre and post micturition volumes, and uroflometry. This is a one-stop facility for children, which is an absolute must for us to manage in patients with reflux appropriately. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and that just 20 seconds short of 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ram, for, uh, for this very uh, wide and global view on treatment of reflux. And uh, we will listen now to uh, Francois Varlet. He will give us more precisely on the laparoscopic approach.
Thank you very much uh, to the IPEC, to the ESPES, to the ASPU to invite me and uh, especially for uh, all the chairman and uh, François Beckmer who invite in uh, the arcade. It's always uh, amazing to work uh, here. Now, I have to speak uh, about uh, laparoscopic treatment of uh, vesicoureteral reflux in children. And uh, I have no conflict of interest. And uh, I agree totally with the introduction of uh, Professor Subramaniam uh, because uh, the medical treatment is uh, the most important in vesicoureteral reflux in about uh, 90% because uh, we have uh, bladder dysfunction and especially uh, an hyperactivity. And the most often with the education, with the regular avoiding micturition, sufficient drinking, and treatment of uh, the constipation, uh, the reflux is uh, uh, in, a, in a good way. But sometimes, uh, in spite of uh, this kind of treatment, uh, surgical treatment uh, is required, especially when uh, we have a repeated uh, urinary tract uh, infection, or a renal scar, or decreasing of renal function of the DMSC scan, and uh, when we have a malformation, and uh, especially when we have a duplex uh, system. For a uh, surgical treatment, we usually we have to wait uh, for 12 or 18 months uh, of age before uh, surgery because uh, during the first year of life, we have a uh, nervous uh, maturation of the bladder and uh, it is very important to respect uh, this uh, maturation. And uh, during this uh, first year, it, uh, the, the most often we have to use uh, prophylactic antibiotics or in uh, the boy, circumcision. When uh, we decide to do a surgical uh, procedure, surgical correction, uh, we have uh, numerous uh, procedures. And uh, today, I have to focus uh, about uh, extra vesical reimplantation by laparoscopy. This is a Lee Gregoire procedure with an uh, approach of uh, the posterior wall of the bladder. Uh, to do uh, extra mucosal myotomy and after to do a suture over the ureter with the after ureteral lying close to the mucosa. The first uh, laparoscopic procedure was described by, by Yuvrikel May from uh, Mexico. And uh, after 2007, we uh, use uh, this technique. For the installation, uh, we put uh, always a bladder stand because we have to empty or to fill the bladder during the procedure. The video column is at the feet, the surgeon at the head, and but uh, after uh, 10 or 11 years old, we have to be uh, beside uh, the patient. Uh, we use a five millimeter, 30 degree uh, telescope uh, and uh, three millimeter ports and instruments. And you can see in the movie, the place of uh, the telescope uh, through the umbilicus and the two uh, three millimeter ports at the same level uh, and uh, very uh, high when uh, it's a young uh, child and uh, very low when uh, it's an old, uh, older uh, child. So uh, this is an example of uh, legislative procedure and uh, the first step is to empty the bladder to see very well the ureter and you can see here the ureter at the level of uh, the iliac vessels and you have to place uh, the child in trendelenburg position about uh, 20 uh, to 30 degree and uh, after opening of uh, the peritoneum you can uh, cut it and uh, it is very important to place quickly uh, tape around the ureter to avoid the uh, injury of uh, this uh, ureter during uh, all the procedure. And we place always a tape to avoid the uh, injuries of uh, the ureter. And after, it's possible to pull up the ureter and you can uh, do the dissection with the opening of the peritoneum until the bladder. Here we have to 
place the fallopian tube and the ovary uh, laterally, and after, you can see it's uh, very easy to open the peritoneum until the bladder, here uh, medially, and after laterally, after coagulation, not too close from the ureter to spare the ureteral vascularization. Again, uh, medially, and we have to, to dissect uh, the ureter. After this uh, dissection, we push down the tape before to open the ligament. With an anterior and posterior layer, and after it's possible to, to grasp the tape and to pull up again the ureter and to finish the dissection of the low ureter. But uh, keep in mind uh, with the, this dissection because uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, nerves around uh, the ureter and uh, I prefer to push and to release uh, <coughs> smoothly this uh, uh, tissue to avoid uh, coagulation and to avoid uh, cutting of uh, the nerves. We finish to open the peritoneum and uh, it is time to fill the bladder with uh, about 100 milliliter of serum and we pull up the ureter to see exactly uh, where to do the tunnel and the myotomy. And I draw this uh, future myotomy with coagulation. And to have a very good uh, exposure of the posterior wall of uh, the bladder, I place a transperitoneal suspension And uh, we keep uh, the needle outside and we place a grasper to have a good tension of the posterior wall. After I perform the detrusorotomy, after coagulation, and I cut progressively the muscle and I spread the scissors to find the mucosa. Yes, the mucosa begin to appear, you can see here. And I grasp all the wall, muscular wall, before to open widely the detrusor. It is possible to use a hook, but uh, I prefer use the scissors. And uh, it's possible to do a very good uh, dissection. Sometimes we have to add an, another transparietal thread to, to do suspension and to improve the view on the posterior wall of uh, the bladder. I pull up again the ureter to uh, see the good direction for myotomy. And we finish this myotomy close to the ureter. This uh, final uh, part of uh, detrusotomy is often uh, more difficult because we have a lot of uh, arteries and uh, risk of uh, hemorrhage. We are at the end of uh, this section. And the next step is to do a transparietal suspension of the ureter to uh, lie the ureter close to the mucosa. And uh, after we have to 
do the suture of uh, the death resort, and I begin uh, f with the lowest point, lowest uh, knot, over the, the ureter. I always uh, check uh, below this uh, first knot because sometimes we have to add another knot lower, especially when, when uh, we have uh, diverticulum. And uh, we finish uh, the procedure with the two or three other points, knots, and uh, total, totally we have uh, four or five knots. And this is the end of the procedure. And uh, usually I, I check always the entrance of uh, the ureter to be sure it's not uh, narrow. And I leave uh, about 100 to 150 milliliter of serum in the, the bladder and at the end of the procedure, I uh, remove the bladder stent. In a boy, uh, we have to do the dissection uh, with the vase, and uh, it's uh, exactly the same dissection uh, than uh, after a fallopian tube, and uh, we have to place uh, the ureter uh, forward uh, like this, and I place uh, the tape around the ureter before to finish uh, the dissection. And uh, the other steps are exactly uh, the same. Here is a bilateral reimplantation and you can uh, see uh, as in the robot the same uh, result. And, uh, you can see here the filling of the bladder, and we had uh, no uh, kinking, and uh, the bladder uh, fill above the reimplantation. Sometimes uh, we have uh, itch, and uh, especially with the mucosal uh, releasing, and if you spread uh, too much the scissors, you have a tear of the mucosa. How to do? It's possible to grasp uh, the hole and to place a uh, loop and after it's possible to continue uh, the procedure without problem. If you have no loops, uh, you have to empty the bladder and to do suture uh, before to uh, continue. Now we prefer uh, between uh, 207 and 215, uh, 16, I'm sorry, uh, we treated uh, 117 children and uh, with the 68 uh, unilateral uh, vesico, uh, unilateral reflux, and we treated uh, 33 uh, duplex system, three ureterocil, eight diverticulum, and uh, uh, especially uh, grade uh, uh, three or four grades, and the mean renal function was about uh, 37%. And we treated uh, 10 failure of uh, endoscopic uh, procedure all of this uh, uh, data is uh, uh, detailed in the paper uh, published uh, recently in the World Journal of Urology. We never uh, do uh, conversion, and we uh, the reflux uh, was treated by uh, a fellow or resident in uh, uh, about uh, one fourth of uh, cases, assisted by a senior. We it's possible to associate uh, other procedure as. Uh, Opening uh, endoscopic opening of uh, ureter cell, uh, upper pole nephrectomy or opposite uh, total nephrectomy, and uh, in uh, 15 bilateral reflux, we treated with uh, one side avec, uh, endoscopic treatment and the other side with the lich grégoire procedure by laparoscopy. And uh, the postoperative course is amazing, and you can see uh, this uh, young uh, girl uh, the day after a bilateral reimplantation, and uh, 
but yet she needs uh, only uh, paracetamol and the, uh, she had no bladder stand, she had normal urines and it's uh, really amazing. And uh, it's possible to do this procedure in outpatient and uh, 14 patients were treated uh, with the unilateral reflux in the ambulatory uh, surgery. We had uh, two uh, complications, two serious complications at the beginning of uh, our training with the two ureteral leakage at uh, day seven and day 15, probably uh, because uh, we never use uh, a tape around the ureter and probably uh, we grasp uh, too much uh, the ureter with the injuries. And uh, since uh, more than uh, 100 cases, we used uh, the tape around the ureter and we had uh, no uh, recurrence of uh, this kind of complication. Uh, one other complication is bladder paresis uh, with a very long paresis during uh, several months described uh, by open surgery with the uh, uh, laparoscopy. We never had uh, this kind of pathology, but uh, a friend uh, who performed a bilateral reflux uh, uh, two years ago had uh, uh, bladder paresis uh, in a boy during uh, five months. And I think uh, we have to be uh, cautious and uh, keep mind uh, with the dissection of uh, the low ureter. And uh, I think uh, we have, uh, uh, we uh, don't, don't uh, do uh, co any coagulation in the lower, uh, the lower ureter to avoid uh, nerves injury. Our follow-up is uh, about uh, uh, five years and uh, we had uh, five failures uh, treated by one open cohen, one uh, sting procedure, two redo laparoscopic uh, Lisch-Gregoire procedure and one expectant. And our rate of success is about uh, 96%. Now about discussion, uh, we tried uh, with this uh, procedure to uh, keep advantage of uh, endoscopic treatment and Cohen, open Cohen procedure, because uh, with the Lisch-Gregoire laparoscopic procedure, we have a very uh, small scares, a very short uh, hospitalization, and it's possible to do uh, in outpatient uh, 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 laparoscopy. And the postoperative comfort is excellent. And uh, about results, our results uh, are uh, the same uh, with the open uh, Cohen procedure with about 96%. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, reimplantation, extra vesical reimplantation, is very interesting for uh, the future adult because uh, the uh, ureteral meatus is always is in the same place. And I think it's uh, better for urologists when uh, they do a ureteroscopy uh, in adults. Uh, what about uh, open niche grégoire? Because uh, a few colleagues uh, used use uh, open Lisch-Gregoire for unilateral reflux only, and they have a, a very good uh, result, and it's difficult to compare, and I think uh, we have no uh, uh, significant difference be 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 between uh, open and laparoscopic uh, unilateral Lisch-Gregoire. What about uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery? Uh, Jeff Valla and C.K. Young uh, developed uh, the pneumovesicoscopy and the Cohen uh, by pneumovesicoscopy with excellent results, and uh, we are uh, several to use uh, this uh, extra vesical reimplantation with a good result, uh, too. My conclusion is uh, laparoscopic uh, Lich Grégoire is a very good procedure for me because uh, it's an easy approach of uh, the posterior wall of the bladder. We have uh, uh, good results, and I think it's a good alternative. Uh, to uh, treat uh, vesico ureteral reflux. I think it's a reproducible technique, but uh, when we have uh, to treat uh, ureteral cell or large diverticulum, I think it's a limit of uh, the lich uh, procedure, and uh, maybe we have to use uh, pneumovesicoscopy, and uh, we need uh, more follow-up to conclude uh, over uh, this, uh, over all uh, the procedure. Uh, what is the best, I don't know exactly. But uh, la the extra vesical uh, reimplantation by laparoscopy, I think, is very uh, good uh, technique. Thank you uh, for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francois and Ram. And uh, 
we we have we start to have uh, questions from by the internet, and the first one it's coming from our uh, young colleague Maria Escolino from Naples, uh, Italy. Uh, she's asking both of you what is the length of the uh, learning curve to do uh, reimplant for uh, robotic or uh, standard laparoscopic the learning curve. What's the length of the learning curve for the young fellows, for you yourself as, as an excellent uh, laparoscopist in the beginning? I think uh, with the uh, extravesical laparoscopy, uh, I think uh, 10 mm. cases is uh, efficient to be... Uh, we have seen that you have 30% of your rate done by the fellows. Yep. So it's uh, during their fellowship they achieve this. Yeah, I okay. think about uh, the cases. Tram for the robotics. I think to answer the robotics is quite difficult because it's still early days when robotics is catching up. But if we talk about a general holistic approach to robotic procedures, if you do about 20 procedures, which might be a pyeloplasty or reimplant, whatever, then you're actually pretty competent using the robot. Um, the issue about learning curve in reimplantations is that I still think that the number of reimplantations are still low generally in a teaching referral hospital, especially if you have a facility for endoscopic correction. And therefore, um, to be able to just learn on reimplantations is going to take much longer in terms of time. If you're talking about procedures, then yeah, if you have anything like 15, 20 procedures is good. But to be able to do 15, 20 procedures for a resident, it's going to take much longer. Therefore, you need to have experience um, in, in a, in, you know, generally in the robot. Once you're, fi f you're comfortable with that, when you saw the technique of robotic approach that I presented to you, you can see it's really, really easy. So it's just a basic technique, and after that, it's a question of just facilitating. So i sorry, it's a round wide answer, because I can't give you a straightforward at this point of time. OK, and we have uh, Paula Arevas. Uh, can you please also, the, for the internet that you mention your country, where you're coming from? So Paula is asking. Uh, you, what's your first attitude in high grade reflux, grade four or grade five? Uh, is it you are going to start with endoscopic insection and then in failure re implant, or you go th straight away to re implant and, of course, robotic or laparoscopy? Okay. Um, my, my philosophy is, is very simple, irrespective of the grade of reflux. I would always, always. I have a cystoscopic evaluation, and then attempt an endoscopic correction if it is feasible. And then I would think about other steps, unless the anatomy precludes me to be able to do any endoscopic correction, which means if the ureteric orifice is absolutely so dilated that you're not just going to be able to manage to do anything. So the configuration of the orifice to begin with is far more important than necessarily worry about the grade of reflux. However, to caution that if you have grade five reflux, your luck success rates to be able to just get rid of the whole problem in just one procedure is less likely. I'm not saying that that's a contraindication, but I think a proper cystoscopic evaluation and then deciding, but always, always an endoscopic correction, if possible first, followed by reimplantation. Francois? For me, when uh, we have uh, four or five uh, high-grade uh, reflux, uh, my first step is to evaluate the bladder. Because uh, if uh, we have a bad bladder, we have to do re-education. We have to do, uh, treat uh, this uh, dysfunction, if possible, because I think it's the most important in the treatment. Uh, now, uh, on the other side, uh, we have to to, to do uh, scintigraphy, DMSA scintigraphy, to evaluate. If we have a very good uh, kidney and a uh, 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 few symptoms, uh, it's not necessary to, to treat surgically. It's possible to treat with only uh, medical treatment. If we have uh, uh, dysfunction, renal dysfunction, very important, scares, uh, repeated uh, urinary tract infection, I prefer to do a surgical treatment, and in these cases, I prefer a reimplantation uh, than uh, endoscopic treatment. Yeah. I just want to add a point to a very valid point which Francois brought up that if you have a, a very bad bladder, 
the severe bladder dysfunction for various causes, then actually a surgical operation is contraindicated. You've got to look elsewhere to make sure that sort of problems are sorted and you prepare the patient better. Yes, you can do a reimplantation, but after making sure the blood drainage is effective. So that's caution that one needs to exercise. Yeah. So our first Paula was from uh, Spain. Don, she asked this question. Now another Paula Henrik from Brazil. She's asking an interesting question. Uh, if you have a grade 5 and uh, you need to do modeling of the ureter, are you going to change your opinion about approach, extravesical or intravesical approach, to do tapering? Tapering. 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 If you have a grade 5 dilated uh, atonic ureter, uh, are you going to just re-implant the extravesical or you are going to do uh, tapering of the ureter, and if you do tapering, mm -hmm. this would change your choice of approach. Okay, with the with the um, um, robotic approach, um, generally, if you create a a sufficient detrusorotomy wide enough to wrap the ureter, then just with reflux tapering. It's not that essential. Now, I can understand in some circumstances it's, it's, it, it may be necessary, but the only times I've tapered are for mega ureters when they are significantly dilated and there is an element of VUJ obstruction, which means a narrowing down there. So in cases of reflux with coexisting obstruction, then you can do tapering. In terms of which procedure, I will always stick still with a, a leech Gregoire because um, I can do a tapering from within the robot by just anchoring the ureter onto the abdominal wall and then do an excisional tapering and then re-implant in the same fashion as we showed you in the video. So yes, the answer is extra recycle. Uh, to, to just to be clear, it's important for the audience, is uh, if you have a mega ureter, as you have said, you are not going to go for endoscopic injection at all. No, no, no. So, it's so, associated so, so as I said, segment. Yes, so as I yes. said earlier on, yeah. that what all depends, endoscopic treatment indication depends upon the anatomy from within the bladder. You must be able to be confident that you can park the implant in a submucosal plane. The times that things fail is because the needle advances very quickly outside the bladder or into the ureteric wall, like you saw in the video which I demonstrated to you, when the, 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 it doesn't work. So it's a question of judgment, and that's why I keep saying endoscopic correction should not be taken lightly. It's an it's an actually an expert operation where you need to make judgments, even though it's a it's a it's a it's a relatively um, a quick procedure. It needs to be done very well. Otherwise, you can have more complications than you can imagine. And believe me, if you have a deflux um, outside the bladder and causing adhesions and obstruction. And the number of us in this room would have been doing an open operation. It's a nightmare to get into the, in an open surgery. And that's why in these cases, robotics or even the laparoscopy extravasycle is a good approach. But um, you've got to be very careful with endoscopic correction and, and just don't take it lightly and don't leave it to your resident. Just do it I'm, and the boss sits in the coffee room. What about you, Francois? Are you going to do yeah. it, uh, if, it is, if you need tapering to change your uh, approach or not? Yes. Uh, for me, the, the grade, high grade, it's uh, always impressive on the cystography and uh, for the radiography. But uh, for me, uh, the most important uh, s uh, measure is uh, under sonog ultrasonography because uh, sometimes, uh, very frequently, uh, the size of the ureter is uh, uh, lesser than. Uh, in the radiography in voiding. And uh, if uh, the ureter is about uh, 10 to 12, I think uh, reimplantation is possible. Uh, if uh, it's uh, larger than 15 or 20, maybe it's possible to do a Kalisinski uh, tapering and after to do reimplantation. After, it's always possible to perform an other kind of tapering, like uh, end drain tapering with the uh, it's possible to pull out uh, the ureter, to cut the ureter and to pull out uh, through a, a left uh, troca and to uh, perform the tapering outside before to do reimplantation. But this case is not so frequent, mm. yeah. I think. Certainly. That's right. 
And, and uh, Kumar Avel from India is asking you just to give us uh, a short uh, answer about the uh, protocol of follow-up. Are you doing uh, cystogram routinely or not? Okay. Um, clear answer. Um, antibody prophylaxis, stop it a week to two weeks after the, after the procedure, ultrasound scan in six weeks' time, and nothing else unless there is a problem on the ultrasound scan. For irrespective of any procedure I do, endoscopic correction, reimplantation, whatever, whichever technique, that's a simple thing for me. I only do for the investigations if there is some problem on the ultrasound scan, like significant upper tract dilatation, or the patient is clinically symptomatic. We perform a cystogram uh, after our 31st uh, procedure and after uh, when uh, we have uh, seen uh, we have no reflux we stop and today we never perform a cystogram uh, routinely uh, only if uh, the child have a, a urinary tract infection and uh, if you have a, a two years old boy with the persistent symptomatic reflux after open surgery. What's your approach for this? Would you go directly to endoscopic treatment or you would go It was a Lich Grégoire procedure? Francois first and then Ram would I'm give sorry. Us. It yeah. was Lich Grégoire procedure open? It was a unilateral Lich Grégoire yeah. procedure. I think it's possible to, to redo uh, Lich Grégoire under laparoscopy, I think. Uh, we had uh, two failures uh, in our uh, data and uh, we treated by redo and I think it's possible to, uh, uh, to do a, a longer uh, tunnel. Uh, I think and it's possible after Lich Gagoire, after Cohen procedure, I don't know exactly. Yeah, Shram? Um, I think if you have... Okay, I, I want to answer this question differently. I think um, if, the, if the question is to ask, um, can you do endoscopic correction after an open reimplantation, um, and if it is least Gregoire, the answer is you must attempt, yes. So I've had a patient with bilateral uh, duplex reimplantation with persistent reflux, and I have uh, uh, treated her with um, endoscopic correction, which means if you have a plane by which you can, par if you, you can park the implant, you should try. That's only for least Gregoire. The Cohen's reimplantation, I think it's extremely difficult to manage. You probably just have to go back for a redo operation because, like Francois says, it, it will be it'll be tough. But you could you could actually pass a ureteric catheter and then and then approach the score from the top, and therefore you might be able to achieve. But that's a bit tedious, and I, I personally don't have experience with doing um, endoscopic correction after Cohen's. So. Uh, but uh, probably, if uh, I have this uh, situation, probably I try I uh, try to to do endoscopic injection before to, to redo uh, laparoscopy. For redo the laparoscopy. Probably, yeah. Uh, and uh, if you have a, a bilateral case, I think you have answered for the, if you have a bilateral case who's high grade, like high grade five uh, in a boy, are you going to is it would change anything in your procedure or when it, if it's a bilateral case or you will go through bilateral extra physical uh, reimplant? We, it, it depends really. I think that's, that's, that's a question This is very difficult to answer just like that, depending upon the clinical symptomatology. I think no, I would I mean, be cautious. Of course, if it's, uh, there is indication. I mean, We're talking about bilateral, of course, bilateral primary vesicular degree reflux, yes. not secondary to any oh, valves or anything like that. In course, primary case, in, in, in primary, again, I would try an endoscopic correction. As I said, I will always go for an evaluation. If the bladder permits to do it, then I would. If it's not, then I will do a reimplantation. I'll warn the parents of the chances of reimplantation, possibly a higher in bilateral grade, high grade reflux. I, I repeat again, uh, if uh, we are, I have a bilateral high grade uh, reflux, I check the bladder because probably it's a very, very bad bladder and maybe it's uh, not necessary to redo uh, reimplantation, and the question is uh, uh, vesicostomy. Uh, is is, is a, a good question? Is, yeah. is a vesicostomy uh, 
use, useful for this uh, child. We have uh, Maria Scolino again asking from Naples, and she's asking you, uh, what's your protocol if you do a bilateral? Are you going to leave a stent or not? Stent and what catheter. is physical, uh, no, you not stent, extent. Uh, indwelling catheter in the bladder? Do you leave routinely indwelling catheter? And second, what's your, I think you have said that in the rate for uh, Francois, he said that bilateral extravesical laparoscopic, he has no re urinary retention in his series. What about you? And do you leave routinely uh, okay. urethral catheter in bilateral cases? Okay. In, in, for me, every patient of reimplantation, transiently, I would leave the urinary catheter for a good few hours, irrespective of unilateral or bilateral. Just a patient settle down a little bit. I would take the catheter out six to eight hours later if it is the operation in the morning, or I would leave it overnight and take it in the morning first thing, irrespective of unilateral or bilateral. Coming to the point about retention of urine, retention of urine happens in bilateral cases. If your dissection has been extravesical on the lateral aspects of the bladder when you do an open operation. When you go by laparoscopic or robotic approach, like you've seen, we go right onto the vesicular ureteric junction so focused that it's unlikely to affect the nerves. So I have not seen a case of retention of urine post minimally invasive bilateral reimplantation. I never leave uh, ureteral or bladder stent uh, at the end of the procedure, uh, but uh, probably between uh, five to 10 children we need uh, to place uh, bladder stain uh, during the night because of uh, retention. But uh, just for a few hours and after uh, they had a good uh, voiding. I, I have a provocative question. You have convinced us for bilateral cases. I think we're all convinced and we can see from the internet also they are all convinced about bilateral cases. The advantage over open surgery. What about a boy, three years old, is having grade three symptomatic reflux unilateral? How are you going to convince the parents or your colleagues that robotic and minimal invasive is better than open extravesical? And in which criteria? Is it pain? Is it uh, hospital stay or its efficiency? Is he symptomatic, this boy? Is the boy symptomatic? Yeah, of course. I yeah. mean, there is, there is an indication, of course. If there's an indication for, for procedure, then I would still do yeah. an endoscopic correction. Why are we doing a reimplantation on a three-year-old boy with grade three reflux? Yeah, but you're doing this. But, but, uh, but Francois is doing uh, extra cycle. That's right? Yeah. Yeah. So how can you... What, 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 how, what, what's your, uh, how can you defend this to the parents? Your question is over open surgery. Open over um, open surgery. Open extravesical or laparoscopic? Uh, as I told you uh, on my topic, uh, I think we have no this answer because yeah. uh, uh, the results after open and uh, laparoscopic are very good too. And also that in, in you cannot do the major difficult cases if you don't do this grade three or grade four unilateral. That's right. And the only thing I can mention is that yeah. um, the, the open operation, if you're going to do it, you're doing a final C incision. So therefore, that's much more uh, far around pain relief and everything else. And it's going to take a bit longer for a child to recover compared to minimally invasive approach. So I think it's quite selling. To the, I don't think the parents are going to mind that much. All they want is the child to be treated. If it's, again, it depends on the surgeon, how you sell your, 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 how confident you are and how much they trust you. Thank you and very uh, much. It was really very interesting to treat such difficult situation with both of you. Philip, my co-chair, uh, Philip Zivai. You can I, like can I ask both of you for a last question? Is there, what, what are your thoughts about um, comparing laparoscopic Lisch Gregoire with intravesicoscopic um, Cohen procedures? Is there a place? Inter Intravesical Cohen? Cohen, yeah. You mean comparing in terms Vesicoscopic of Cohen? Comparing it as uh, anti-reflux procedure. Is there, what, what are your thoughts about your considerations? Uh, the Cohen procedure under pneumovesicoscopy is a very good, uh, very nice technique. But I think it's uh, most difficult because uh, the approach of uh, uh, the bladder uh, to have a very good proof to avoid any leakage uh, during <coughs> the procedure 
is uh, not so evident. And uh, the second one is uh, after pneumovesicoscopy, uh, they uh, leave uh, bladder stain during two or three days to avoid the leakage. And I think it's, uh, I prefer Lige uh, Gregoire because uh, the postoperative course is really amazing for me. But I think uh, Quen procedure is a very nice procedure. I think the very simple answer, if you want to do both pneumovesicoscopic or extravesical leech or laparoscopically is feasible, you think of a robot, the current state of instrument play with 12 millimeter and 8 millimeter being the only functional instruments, I think doing a coens in a small child is, 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 is just crazy. So you would stick with our extra cycle because the five millimeter instruments need far more space to maneuver because they are metal driven and not cable driven technology. So the five millimeter instruments made by the company for pediatric use is, is, is complete waste of time. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank you again for all this uh, very nice presentation and to we'll leave uh, to the talk to our uh, master of ceremony, uh, Philippe Montupé. And thank you, Philippe, for uh, inviting all of us. Thank you a lot. Really, I think we had a very enjoying session. Just prior to the opening of the session, I asked Chiro some words of conclusion, and I have just to comment by my own and short uh, words, because one aspect of the session we did not advocate above the surgery is the management, and uh, nothing could happen without the example and the success of the IRCAD, of uh, its president, of its chairman for pediatric surgery courses. And uh, that is exactly, we realized together, this management, we were friendly working hard to the success of this session. Why? Only because the good management needs a lot of courtesy and generosity. It's absolutely something aside the surgery, but you here are the very good example working together through societies. And I give the words for Chiro to Chiro because Chiro only is a, a current president, but all of you are past, uh, will be president, are in the same position. And uh, uh, really, uh, a lot of uh, thanks for this aspect of our session collaborative uh, um, among three international society. Please, Chiu. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, in quality of president, president of uh, European Society of Pediatric Endoscopic Surgery, is a great honor for me to close uh, this third masterclass in collaboration between ESPES, IPEG, and ESPES. I think that it was a very interesting masterclass, and my opinion is confirmed because uh, we received hundreds of questions coming from all over the world, from Brazil to India to Europe to USA. To conclude, first of all, I, have, uh, I would like to thank Professor Jacques Maresco, uh, Professor Maresco, hosted for the second time in Strasbourg our pediatric masterclass. Thank you very much. Uh, Strasbourg is a wonderful venue to organize this kind of event. I have to thank uh, the two chairmen and the two organizers of this uh, masterclass, Professor Philippe Montoupé and François Beckmer. We started to organize uh, this masterclass one year ago, and I think uh, is a, a true success. Thank you very much, Philippe uh, and François. I would like uh, to thank uh, all uh, the IRCAD technicians for their excellent and uh, professional work. For sure, I have to thanks to the three society, IPEG, uh, ESPES, and ESPUT that endorsed uh, this meeting. Uh, and I have to, to thank uh, the chairman. We are a group of friends. Thank you very much, Professor Elgonemi, Professor Mendoza, Professor Zavai, and all the speakers, uh, uh, Professor Varley, Professor Submaramian, Professor Thiel, Professor Beckmer, and in particular, 
my friend Mark Vulcan. Mark uh, arrived directly from USA for this masterclass. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll be back in, in USA. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Tubia. It's a pleasure. And in conclusion, I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, for your attention, and for your patience. Uh, and uh, see you next year in Strasbourg for the, for the Masterclass of Pediatric Mini Valley Invasive Surgery. Thank you very much.